My name is Brett. I'm 20 years old, and I live in Fairdale, Kentucky. This is a little girl's bike. I like it, though. Brett is technically my cousin, but I look to him more as a little brother. You know, we grew up together. He's funny, outgoing. You know, we've had good times. Oh, my God, I'm out of breath. Brett is my grandson. That In my mind, he's never grown up. He's still just a little boy. Brett fills a, a hole in my heart. Where did you get that? Did I get it? Yes. We need to know that, don't we? Brett always used to be honest, and I think he's still honest now. If you confront him with something, he will tell you the truth. Yeah, I stole it. But uh, the drugs have changed him. Pharaoh used to be, a, a, you know, a, a tight-run little community, but now it's just overrun by drugs. I'm currently addicted to heroin and methamphetamine. I have no idea how often he uses, but I know he uses every day. Whatever he can get his hands on, it doesn't matter to him. About a year ago, he went out the back door, and I seen the bottom of his feet on the ground by his mom's truck. My husband ran out there, and Brett had already quit breathing. I did Narcan and while my husband pumped his chest and waited for the ambulance to come. That's the scariest thing that I've ever been through in my life. Because his lips were already blue, he was, he looked dead. I ain't doing so good health-wise. I got hepatitis C, cellulitis, anxiety, depression. He weighs 96 pounds. His skin and bones, his eyes are sunk back in his head. He just, he looks horrible. If Brad doesn't stop using, he is absolutely going to die. He will not make it to C21. Uh, I just see my mom every once in a while when I can. My mom is cool. She's really independent and never really been like this low life where I'm at now. So she's somebody to look up to. Ride or die to the end with my mom. My dad's never been around. He walked out when I was younger, so he just wasn't there, and that's how it was. You been up all night or something, babe? You don't look good. I'm tired. I worked all day, you know? My anxiety's shot. Trying to get me some ice. You need to go to bed. You don't need to do no ice, dude. Michelle can't deal with Brett's addiction and she just shuts down. And she talks horrible to Brett, then he wants to shut down. It's a vicious circle is what it is. Brett lives with his mama and with his mom. It's kind of like a back and forth game. When Sharon makes him mad, then he goes running to his mother's, and then when she makes him mad, it's like just back and forth, back and forth. You look exhausted, I know, honey. I'm just overwhelmed, man. I've had enough stress. Shut up, Brett. So overwhelming, man. When he's using opiates, how does Brett look for acts? He acts crazy. Um, he's, he's gray, he looks terrible. Can you describe how tiny he is, how is? I can't do this, you all. I'm sorry, I can't do it. Can you tell me what's wrong and how we can work together? It, I very feel too uncomfortable to do this. I can't do this. I don't think Brad will say yes to treatment if his mother is not there. Um, this is his last chance. This is his absolute last chance. His mom is bipolar. Okay. And his dad is an alcoholic. Okay. Brett's dad wasn't ever around when he was growing up. He was always out doing something different. He never had time for Brett. His father not being there for the past 18 years, I think it's kind of taken a toll on him. He's never obviously sat down and talked to me about it, and he don't ever talk about his dad, but I feel like he thinks about him a lot and wonders, why is he not there? Why don't he answer my calls? Why don't he check on me? You know, what happened? What went wrong? Michelle contacted Intervention. Uh, she thought that that's what's the only thing she could do that was left for her to do to help Brett. So she got it all started and then backed out. And she's put it all on me now. Michelle had a boyfriend that moved in there. 
and he uh, come in one night and he beat up Michelle. I walk in and he's stomping on top of her back, you know, like punted her like a football, kicked her in her mouth while she's down on the ground. And I just saw, I seen the blood all over the floor, I seen her crying. I didn't know what to do. You know, I could have beat him up if I tried. I think I ran up to him and hit him or something, you know, but I was just a kid, so it ain't like it really fazed him. Brett tried to break him up, and he beat Brett up, too. He went to jail for domestic violence. The next, when I talked to my mom, he's talking in the background where she, she had went and bonded him out. I was still mad about it. Like, how could you be sitting there with him? You know, are you crazy? The end result is Shell recoups. She gets better. Brett, he may carry it with him the rest of his life, and she done forgot about him. I was just heartbroken, you know. That was my mom. That was all, you know, all I had for real. It just, it's whatever from then on, I don't know. And I wasn't, you know, this is before drugs. I think I just mentally just shut down for real. I'm, I'm gonna come down in a minute. Don't come in here. I need a minute. Sweetie. Yeah, I need a minute. That's what I'm saying. I, I know. I'm not, I'm not coming in. No, nah, no, I need a minute. I know, back but I like... need you to hear me, sweetie. No, nah, no, I'm saying back up, though. Come, going through something right now. I need, you know what I'm saying? I need privacy. When Brett's on heroin or opiate, he's kind of like a zombie. But when Brett's on meth, his mood swings crazy. He gets very violent, throwing stuff, stomping, screaming, hollering. Back up, y'all. Go, go outside right now. I'm doing something. Man, I'm done with this. Hello, come on, How are you? Hi, I'm Hello. Michelle. I'm Heather. Good to meet you. Me too. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> when I walked in the door and saw Michelle, I was relieved and grateful to see her sitting there. Brett's had so many abandonment issues. And it's vital that everyone who's participating in the intervention show up and be an active participant. Sip some ammo. Hey, buddy. Fred, hi. I'm Heather. It's good to meet you. I think you already know that I love you more than life itself. And you're the most important person in my life. I worry about you constantly if you will make it through another night. I'm in constant fear of losing you, and it makes my life hell. I think you already understand that you have a, a disease that is bigger than you. That's why I'm asking you to get the help you need today, please. If it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity and you can finally begin to live life the way you should be, I love you more than anything in this world. Will you do it? Please, will you go for us? Please go, Brett, please. You're tearing these people up, and you don't give a f You don't give a f about nobody but yourself. <laughs> Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. I love you. I love you, too. I want you healthy. I want you I'm healthy. Straight, you ain't straight. You're not. You're breaking everybody down with you. You don't belong in jail, and you don't belong in a homeless shelter, and you don't belong in the war. Uh, You've got a choice to make now. I know the games you play. I know the money that was taken out of my wallet, even though I don't say anything. But we're not going to stand quietly by, especially me anymore. To me, today ch changes the whole thing. You either accept the help, but if you don't, you've got you've to leave. I don't know where you're going to go or what you're going to do, but you're not going to live here anymore. And you won't be allowed in my house either. Run and hide. I don't want the camera on bro. I don't want the camera on them. This is what I was afraid that would happen. I know. But why? Just tell me why you wouldn't go. So I, understand. I understand. I understand. This is a big thing. I understand it. Listen to me. You go down there, you do the days they tell you do, you come back, you got your room. You got your job. You got everything. If you don't go, you ain't got a room. You ain't got a job. So 
He just went in your bag and stole more of your needles. And now he's in the other room. And I just think it has to stop. Did you take some needles out of my... I took one off, but I'm going to use this all That means he's... Shooting up in your house right now. All right, this. All right, so you promise you're going to go to treatment? Yes, I'm going to treatment, yes. OK. Right, Do your very best, OK? Absolutely. OK, you ready? Let's go. Yes. We're over that way. This way, baby. Oh, Wrong way. No, you got to no, go that go way. Now. We can smoke. Go. We get, if we get to the airport, we can smoke. Otherwise, and she's got your bait. Teach her how to bait. Let me know. We be love good. you. Oh yeah, hold on. No, 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 he ain't really hearing what anybody says to him. It's like he don't even acknowledge it. So I don't, I'm not sure. I know it made me feel like that, that's my, not my son. Addiction has total control over him. I want you to nurse. No, the nurse has got it. Go get, I'm calling the cops, dog. You're going to jail. I swear to God, you are. I'm calling the cops right now. Get it for me, Paul. Come on. You know, get up. Get, no, get, just get up with him. I'm going to grab you for her. I'm going. Let's go. Don't grab me. Okay, oh, yeah, just send them as soon as you can, going. please. Thank just you so much. You're good. Thanks. Go. Bye-bye. Make sure to do this treatment. I am, Pat. Bob was trying to give me a suboxone. I good. know what you were trying to do. Do we have the um, child locks on in the back door? Okay. There's a get place. In get in the car. Right. Get in the car. Okay. Hurry, Brett. Hurry, Brett. Hurry, Brett. Hurry Brett. before they take the cigarette out. Let's go. Put the cigarette out. When the cop got here, I was apprehensive. I didn't know if Brett was going to end up going to jail or get in that car and go. And I think that probably was ultimately what made Fred go ahead and leave. Just leaving LA. We're on our way to the airport to go to Philly. I'm Amber Rose. I'm here to help my friend Tina. We grew up in South Philly together, and she's addicted to heroin and crack. I am a model, I'm a philanthropist, I'm an actress, and I'm an entrepreneur. But fame, money, none of that matters when someone's addicted to drugs. I can buy a rehab center for Tina, but she has to want to go. I don't think I could fix people, and that's why I wanted to reach out to Intervention. I really don't know how I feel right now. Like, I'm excited to go and hope for the best, but I don't know. I just hope she says yes to going away and getting help, so I guess we'll just have to wait and see. Tina is missing somewhere in Kensington, and I know that she moves around a lot, so I'm gonna hire a private investigator to find her. Kensington is the jungle. There's a lot of guns, violence, and there's a lot of drugs. I can't believe my friend is out there right now. I was very young, and I used to tell Tina, I'm moving to Hollywood, I'm gonna be famous, and she was like, well, I'm gonna have babies. Ultimately, she wanted to be a mom. I used to tell Tina, like, teen, let's go. Let's get out of here. All my friends were on drugs. Tina was not on drugs at the time. Growing up, I was surrounded by heroin and crack. Not from my mother, but within my immediate family. I just didn't want to do it. I saw what it did to people. I chose to look at that and take a different route. I got on the train one day to New York, probably 19 years old. Found a little apartment, started dancing out there, and I just, I just knew that I didn't want to be here anymore. Then she had Latina, her daughter. I said, okay, you got your baby. Let's get the hell up out of here. And she just wanted different. Hey, Kevin. Hey, Amber. What's going on? Well, I found Tina. Oh, wow. Okay. 
Where is she, where is she? So, so she's living at a house. Uh, I confirmed that she is there with her boyfriend. Okay. There's no way we can get to her there. No, definitely not. I definitely don't want anybody to put themselves or her in jeopardy. Is it possible for me to get her like a place to stay or is it, like maybe I can rent something? I think for safety reasons that would be the best thing. Okay, okay, let me uh let me start working on that and then um I guess I'll call you back. Okay. I'll keep you Sounds posted. Thank you so much, Kevin. So hopefully they find her and then bring her to the Airbnb so we can go through with this intervention. That's the most important thing. Hi, babe, how are you? How you doing? It's been so long. It was amazing seeing Lanaya. She's grown so much. She's so beautiful and smart. Oh my God. Hi, babe. Hey. Hi. Hi guys. Hi, how are you? How's everybody doing? How are you? I'm Michael, by the way. Hi. Nice to meet you, Michael. A little stress, a little nervous? Yeah. yeah. Why? Um, I don't think, like, anybody has gotten my mom to, like, you know, stop doing what she's doing, and I want her to be able to do it just because she wants to do it. Well, what is the biggest thing that you think is blocking her from another chance at life? I think it's she doesn't have the mindset that she wants to get clean, that she wants to live a good life, so she's not going to do that. Because she doesn't. I can't. That's why I said I didn't want to talk about this. I know it hurts, but the more information that I have, the better I'm going to be able to help her. Before your mom got on drugs, I was there, and she loved you guys so much. She put you guys to bed every night. She fed you guys. It's not, this is not your mom, it's the drugs. Y'all gotta know that, and that's why we're doing this. Having family members that are on drugs, sometimes you really do become numb to it, and uh, you can still tell that Lanaya really loves her mom. And she doesn't have a significant other during all of this? Her boyfriend is a good person. He doesn't, you know, beat on her or make her give him her money or anything. Them being young girls, because he's not beating her, because she's not giving him the money, they think that that's a good person. So this morning I was told that Tina's boyfriend, he wants a pretty face to smoke crack with. And that's the honest to God truth. He feeds her drugs, he makes a lot of money, and he doesn't let her out of his sight. Well, wait, wait, what I hear you saying right now is he's a sugar daddy. Yes. And just because he's not beating her doesn't mean that, you know, he, he, he doesn't need to be around her. You know, the, the severity of this intervention is huge. Today is the intervention. I'm excited. My mom's finally going to hear everything we had to say and you know that everybody's here for her. And we're here for you, too. Thank you. We have essentially a gift for you. We want you to go to California, too, and go somewhere to deal with the trauma that you've been through. I think it's a great idea. And we can, we can leave today. We want to help you. It's set up perfectly. It has nothing to do with anything other than dealing with trauma and getting past all this stuff. I would take it, girl. Thank you. Yes? Yes. Yes! <laughs> yeah. I'm so happy. Now let's get your mom and your sister on the same page too, right? Yep. That's, what, that's the goal. Tina, are you going to go with me to get my hair cut? Tina? Hi, babe. Oh, my god. How are you? Hug me, babe. It's OK, babe. I just didn't right want you to see me like this. I know it's OK. I love you. I was too much. <laughs> I miss you so much. I want my sister back. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm glad to see you, though. Me, too. This is my friend, Mike. Hi, Mike. How are you? I'm really grateful that you're, you're even willing to talk. And, like, I mean, I do. I want to get clean. You know what else? She's also going. It's my baby. And she's getting some help today, too. I love you, too. I love you, too. And all you have to do is say yes. 
I have to leave, like, right now, though? Yeah. I want to call my boyfriend, like, what's going on and stuff. We can do all of that in the car? Are you saying yes? I mean, of course I'm going to take the opportunity. I don't I don't have insurance to do you anything. Don't, hey, you don't need to worry about any of that. Your whole life is changing today. Say hello. Yeah. Night. So you're going to go? Yeah, I'm going to go. But I got to go right now. I know. Are you crying? No. Go ahead, talk to her. Lanaya, we're also offering you help for your trauma, the stuff that's been going on with your family. I can't go. Nine, listen to me, right? No, 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 you, you listen to me, Mom. You're trying to separate us. Put up on a plane no. and separate us. No, we're not. No, that's not what we're doing. Not, babe. No. No. She's scared because okay. of everything that they've been through. Come over. I need to pee really big. I need you to be a big girl, Anaya. No one's trying to separate you guys. We would never do that. I think you need to go get Tina. I'm serious, babe. It's detrimental. You know what that means? Can we get Amber up here? Yeah. We need Amber. She said yes, that she wanted to go, but she said she had to go pee. And I knew what it was. She started texting her boyfriend. And I got to be honest with you, I literally hate his guts. Talk to me. How do we make this work? Uh, uh, like, I, I don't know. I just, I don't like the way things went down. I just don't like it. I'm a grown ass woman. I make my own decisions. What the if my, my daughter dies while I'm out there? I did it with my mother, Amber. I lost my mother and I was arguing. Your kids said, are going to lose you. There's really no reason for this, Tina. In the process of her coming outside and walking down the street, she was in communications with her boyfriend. She wanted him to come get her. Where is the car? I don't like being lied to. Tina! Where are you at? Where? Because I'm under the L. I, please, I want to get the out of here before I can go ballistic. Tina, can we stop this? Where's the car? I really hope that my mom takes this as something good and not anything that I did to harm her. She's going to die. She's going to die, bro. Her boyfriend showed up. She got in the car, and so did Lanai. Before I came here, I was like always miserable and angry. And like now, I am happy. <laughs> Hi, <laughs> how are you, babe? Oak Forest is helping me figure myself out. I'm learning how to accept people being there and not pushing people away. How's everything been? It's been good. Like, I've been in like a more positive mindset. It feels good to have like people you could like rely on. Latina's doing really well. This girl, when she got here, extremely resistant. And today, she loves being supported by this community, and she's putting in the work. I'm happy to see you smiling. She absolutely wanted a different life. She knew that there was something wrong. She knew that that's not where she was supposed to be. And then she's out here, she's happy. She doesn't want to go back to Philly. She doesn't want that life anymore. It's a beautiful thing. I'm happy I did it. Me too. Thank you yeah. for believing in me. I love you so much. wild, very outspoken. She had a very good job as a nurse, and she's very witty. She's a smart girl. She is a caring, helpful person. Hey, bye. Bye, honey. She would go out of her way to help you if you needed help. She would save you. Now she can't do that. She can't save herself. 
My name's Caitlin, I'm 27 years old. I'm addicted to crack cocaine. She just smokes it every night and every day. I don't know how she makes money to pay for her drugs. She's been arrested a couple of times for shoplifting. I know she's been affiliated with people that are drug dealers. Caitlin's lost her health, her friends, her life, basically, to crack. The day that we adopted Caitlin was the most exhilarating day of my life. There was so much joy and so much love. We were ecstatic. It was great. Finally, she's now ours. Her parents were getting divorced, and that was really hard for her to deal with. Caitlin was only 14. She was normally very, very clingy, but once her dad and I split up, I felt her pulling away. She wouldn't even let me hug her. We wanted to share the custody. We both wanted her in our lives. That didn't bother me. I was like, sweet, I'm gonna have two different houses or two different rooms. It was gonna be two weeks on, two weeks off. Well, that went on for about four months, and it was, she just couldn't take it. She felt like she was being pulled in so many different directions. When we divorced, my goal was to try to stay in the family home as long as I can so that Caitlin has familiar surroundings and she can progress through high school, which are critical years. She was caught in the middle. So she told him that she wanted to live with me. Two years after the divorce, when I decided to sell the house and went to live with the, my wife now, I think that was a little bit of a blow for her. I remember she was in grade 11, and I don't know how, but uh, we ran into her birth mother of all people at a grocery store. We both stopped dead in our tracks. Caitlin had seen photo albums because her birth mother had provided pictures so she would know what her birth parents looked like, her birth grandparents looked like. I knew right away, because we looked like twins. I'm like, that's my biological mother. I ended up like, going out for like coffee. She's pretty, she's young, and like she's eerily very similar to me. She's very like athletic and like she's bubbly and it was trippy. That's had a big effect on me and I'm wondering all the time, like, what if I would have been raised by my birth mom? What if, what if, what if? It was obviously a huge deal. After they met, she became very close to her biological mom. And I know that she really loves her. It's like, she is cool. And I know my unbiological mom that's raised me my whole life was, like, jealous because I'd go and I'd hang out with her. There was a bit of an awkwardness between the two moms. Caitlin used to strive for her biological mom's attention. I do think somewhere down deep that there's the idea that, you know, she wasn't wanted. I mean, who, who wouldn't feel a little bit of something for that? Meeting my birth mom was something that we just didn't cope with well at all, so. I missed the first semester of grade 11. I did, like, online schooling. I graduated on time, had all my credits and stuff. Once she started nursing, it was kind of just, all right, guys, like, we don't need to go out as often anymore. Like, let's stay in a little bit. She became, like, the Debbie Downer. I paid my way through school. I got my own apartment, bought my own car. I was not using drugs while I was in nursing school, and I graduated nursing. She did extremely well. She got a job where she wanted. Oh, I was so excited for her. I loved nursing and engaging with the patients. I applied for all the open names for the RPNs, and then I got to where I wanted to go, which was a psychiatric hospital. My life was set. She had everything going for her. She was living life. Once she got the job, that's when she started to party again. When we were like early 20s, I did notice that she would get intoxicated and do some things that she would regret the next day, but I never thought that that would have led to anything. Friends were a really big part of her life, and she was hanging out particularly with one friend. He wasn't in the best place, but she loved him. He was a part of our whole group of friends. His mother and father were not married, and, you know, Caitlin was adopted, and they're a little bit of a kindred spirit almost, you know? I don't know how long he'd been using, but it was clear he was using. He was an addict, cocaine addict. She would go over to his house and use with him. They just were hanging out one night and decided, hey, let's go for a drive. And then next thing you know, she was smoking crack. We were at someone else's house, they asked me if I wanted to try it. I said, sure, I was drunk. 
I loved it more than he did. As soon as she started smoking crack, she was fully addicted in what felt like a blink of an eye. It spiraled out of control. Guys would feed me crack, me and my friend were doing it. And within months, I'm that crackhead to the extreme. And then all of a sudden, my best friend died. I thought I'd always have him. We call each other brother and sister. Like he was like, just like, no one will replace him. And like thinking of that death, I just didn't cope with well at all. Her best friend, who she spent every day with, overdosed and died. She has never been the same since. My biggest regret is that we didn't talk that night. I could have somehow saved his life. I literally like, spend my entire life and have the hole in the ground just of living. She's still upset. I don't think she has ever dealt with the loss of her friend. She keeps pushing that feeling away by using. She just wants to get high again. <laughs> She's been charged with stealing liquor from the liquor store. Pass that bottle, thank you. She threatened somebody. <laughs> she got criminally charged. She's been to jail. Five assaults, assault with a deadly weapon. I have like 17 charges. <gasps> Ew, man! Flashlight, yeah. Look at where's the flashlight, man. Look at my socks. Look at my legs. This is gross, man. Look at that. Yeah. Man, you literally want to get like. When Caitlin gets to that state, people can't be around her. She's dangerous. I'm literally going to break the camera. Like, give me the camera. Give me the camera. I think her mom is one of the reasons Caitlin is still very engulfed in this drug life. She drops anything to go and help Caitlin. Me and my dad had a good relationship, but like me and my dad don't talk anymore, which is a horrible thing. My dad disappointed in me. Good morning, family, friends. Mm -hmm. Oh, my on. Hi, Caitlin. Come on in. Literally, absolutely, 100% not doing this. Come on, stay no, in. Come on, stay no. in with us. No. Your family's done a lot of work to get here today. I'm not sitting here with these How people. about staying here? Come on back no, in. No, 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 no. Caitlin, give them a chance to talk to you. Please, Caitlin. I'm gonna... Can you just hear us out, please? Caitlin. 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 I'm telling you, man. Listen to us, and then if you want to leave, you can leave, but at least hear what we have to say, Caitlin. You don't want to miss this. Oh, my God. Please, just... No. Please, God, Caitlin. Don't. Honey, come here, please. Katie, I love you so much. Please, you don't do this anymore. Katie, please. I'm not right now. Please. I'm not right now. I'm not... No! Just get a minute of common sense, no, Katie. No, OK, we... No. This is serious. This is serious okay, stuff. OK, take me please. in summer. We're not a freak show. We're all here you Katie, please, just Caitlin, do a little bit, one, one more step at a time, okay, one step at a time. One step. Caitlin, come on. Stop talking to me like you know me. I don't know you this anymore. Is like, please, like, take I've a seat. I've already been suffocated. I've been asphyxiated by you guys. This is strangulating me, literally, like, get, like, <laughs> All you got to do is get in the van, all right? Maureen's in there with her. They love you. They love you. I no situation to help myself. I know, you're not in good shape. Don't worry about what you said to her. You didn't mean it. She didn't mean it. We're going to take you to detox. It's a private medical detox for seven days. And then you'll get on a plane, and we're going to Vancouver Island. I don't want to listen to anything. You'll get their letters. They're going with us. Let's go to the van. You can do this, Caitlin. <laughs> Bye, Caitlin. Bye. Bye, kids. Bye. Bye, I guys. love you. 
I feel pretty good. There's lots of work to be done. I know that the number one thing in addiction is wanting it, and like definitely I want it. I feel awesome. I feel like a new person and refreshed. Cedars has been really good. It's giving me a new perspective on my life. <laughs> she looks so good. It's different as night and day. I thought that I may have lost her forever. My mom, I'm really looking forward to having a healthy relationship with her. We love you. And my dad, too. I think he's proud of me, and I'm proud of myself, too. My name is Joshua, and I live in Raleigh, North Carolina. I'm 34 years old. Joshua's a very smart man, very intelligent, very articulate. I knew what I wanted out of life very early on. How many other kids have you ever seen that have bought a house, have a family at 21? We were the happy family we all. All we were missing was a white picket fence. He was very, very successful. I bragged about him to everybody. Never hear it anymore. I know, I gotta get back to it. It was a again. lot of fun. He lost everything he had, and it all kind of happened within a uh, one or two year period. I was about 32 years old when I moved back in with mom. Love you, be good. Good morning. My son Joshua is an alcoholic. Well, on top of just having an addiction that takes everything away from my life, I have an additional layer. It's kind of a weird thing. It's like one of the people that eat, you know, sofa cushions or something like that. Joshua is addicted to hand sanitizer. Joshua will drink hand sanitizer nearly every single day. He drinks anywhere from 12 to 28 ounces. All I do is add some water to it. I have drank it completely 100% straight before, uh, but the consistency is, uh, I just, I can't. It's like loogie stuck in your mouth all the time. Yeah, it's not. It never crosses your mind to think that someone would use hand sanitizer to get high. I just couldn't imagine drinking something so thick and gulping it down, it actually makes me sick to my stomach. After I've had one entire bottle, I can actually drink the second bottle completely straight. Hand sanitizer is everywhere. A standard size bottle is actually eight ounces. This is like the most prominent ones that you see on like desks and stuff all over the place. Three and a half shots for $1.39. I don't know any bar in the world that would do that. I'm a binge drinker. I've put myself in some alcohol poisonous type situations very quickly. Hand sanitizer is really dangerous because it's not designed for human consumption. I have no idea what's happening to my brain and my body from all the inactive ingredients. He's going to drink it all, whatever's there. It's a race to the bottom of the bottle. It's destroying him, inside and out, outside and in. He's been in the hospital at least a dozen times in the last three or four months. His heart, liver, kidneys, internal organs is being affected by this stuff. He has seizures. He's been on life support. He's almost gone blind. I live in fear that the phone's going to ring and he's going to be dead anytime. If someone had told me years ago that Joshua would grow up to be addicted to hand sanitizer, I would have called him crazy. There's no way, no way my son, my successful son, would drink hand sanitizer and like it. The day Joshua was born was a surprise. He was born six weeks premature. He was a little teeny itsy bitsy thing. He was a happy baby, very easy going child, but there was a lot of fighting going on between Joshua's father and I. 
So I left and left the children with their father. I raised him from the age of two to 15 with his father, Gary. He was a great, well-mannered uh, kid growing up through the years, never getting any mischief, any trouble. In New York, I grew up in a very small town. Our school was K through 12, and it had about 300 students total. A lot of the people around there were very country and very into hunting, but I like to play guitar and listen to music, and I didn't quite fit in. The summer in between 9th and 10th grade, I was 15 years old. I decided to move in with my mother. Florida was super dynamic, and it was great, and it gave me the opportunity to reinvent myself. Joshua flourished. He took music lessons. He was an A-B student. He excelled at the courses he took. When he went to college, I didn't worry about him ever drinking or smoking or getting in with the wrong crowd because I knew the person he was. He wanted to go to college, get a good job, get a house, and then find the love of his life. When I met Joshua, he was working at a convenience store. He was happy and funny and very knowledgeable, and he had the gorgeous blue eyes. I just melt every time I look into him. I told her that I was 23 years old because I thought that would be believable. And she said she was 27. OK, cool. On our second date, I decided to tell the truth and say, hey, just so you know, I'm 19 years old. And she said, what? You're a teenager? And then she stormed off. And then I called her later and said, hey, that's only four years. What's the problem? She said, well, I lied too. I'm 33. So when we met, we were only four years apart. But by the time we were in love, we were 14 years apart. It didn't seem like I was dating a 19-year-old. A lot of people frowned upon it, but I didn't care, and he didn't care. I fell in love right away, and I fell in love with our kids right away. I wasn't thrilled at all with the relationship in the beginning. This older woman was taking my son and having him become a father right away at 19. I found a house that I wanted to buy. I closed on it when I was 21, and we moved in. He landed a great job. And within a year, he got promoted and was in charge of 14 different convenience stores. I was very proud of him. When Joshua was 27, he decided to have gastric bypass to help with the weight loss. Joshua didn't lose weight as quickly as he wanted to. He couldn't exercise because he was having back issues. I ruptured one disc and then herniated another. I was prescribed hydrocodone, quite a bit of it, like 100 pills a month for about eight months. I got really used to it and started using it in a manner that was not prescribed to me to make me feel happy. After the back surgery, he was feeling better, so they quit prescribing it, and that's when he went to street drugs. I was doing all of them from hydro to oxycodone and fentanyl, like just the whole list of prescription. Alcohol was another thing that he started doing. That with the two of them mixing, he would pass out drunk, swear up and down he's not drinking, but you could tell he's drunk. My addiction became my number one priority, and I was drunk all the time and just not a good husband and I was not a good father. Joshua was in and out of rehabs, but he couldn't stay clean. The more I fought to get him better, the more he fought to get away from me and just push me away and push everybody else away. The big problem was that I was just losing everything left and right. Within a one year span, my children left, I got a divorce, and I lost my job. Somebody in rehab told him how he could do the hand sanitizer, mix it with a little juice so it doesn't taste so bad so you can get drunk. I really don't know what would be worse than drinking hand sanitizer. He had been in the hospital over a dozen times in just the last few months, and I'm terrified that one of these times they're not going to be able to save him. There is a point during the drinking phase that I know that I change. 
that I'd switch from just talking like I normally would to acting out of anger or act out of paranoia without even considering whether it makes sense or not. He used to be a happy drunk. Now he's an angry drunk, and he gets violent. No. I don't have another drink. Give me, dude. Where is the other bottle? Where the is my drink? I only know of the two bottles, the square one and the one that you were. Damn it! How do you not know what I'm talking about? You're the one that came in and asked me where the I was. You're the one that lifted my mattress and says, where is it? And then picked it up. How the do you not know what I'm talking about? Well, it wasn't a square bottle that I picked up on you. I don't give a what shape it was. Where is it? Thank you. Dear Josh, I am here today because I love you. <clears throat> you have so much positive potential for great things that lie ahead for you. I know for a fact you're struggling at this point in your life. I am so afraid for you right now. I am strongly urging you to make an immediate decision and commitment to turn your life around today. Don't give up. I know you can do it. This disease has changed you. The fire in your eyes for life has diminished, and this saddens me. The things like the family or the kids are not as important as getting your next drink, and drugs have made you not care if you live or die, and this scares me. It's time to get help to heal yourself and the family. We've been sick long enough. I'm here to, to tell you that I love you more than you can possibly fathom. But I don't like some of the choices you are currently making. I'm very concerned and afraid that you are killing yourself. I can't and won't sit idly by and be witness to my son's death. Often I've wondered about like what value and what worth I have anymore as a human being because I've lost so much and done so much damage and hurt so many people. The fact that you guys are all here and you write these letters and you visit me shows that I guess I do have a value. Yes, you do. And I do have a worth. Mm -hmm. So in an effort to help me prove to myself that I have it, I will gladly accept any help. Bingo. 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 When Joshua said yes and said he was gonna go, it was the, the happiest moment I've had for a long, long time. We all love you and we know you can do that. I am so relieved and so excited. For the first time in a long time, I feel like I can breathe a sigh of relief that he is on the way to recovery. Anthony, Welcome nice to, to meet the you. Arbor. Thank you. Nice to meet you. I made sure that the treatment center knew to get rid of all the hand sanitizer so they have nothing here. It's all alcohol free. Hand sanitizer is everywhere. It's always in your face. It's available. It's extremely easy to get. So maybe there's a slight concern that I have that I'll be tempted after I get out, but I'm hoping that this is going to help me kind of absolve and learn how to abstain from that. Physically, I feel fine, and my memory is starting to return. I am remembering things better. I am quicker to solve problems. What's been the hardest thing for you these first couple of weeks? After I'd been here like seven days, um, there was an opportunity to take hand sanitizer from a outside meeting that we were at, mm. and I just took it without even thinking. That relapsed kind of made me realize that this is something beyond what I can control. I'm so proud of you for realizing that and just digging in deeper. Hi, sweetheart. Good seeing you. 
Who's cute? You don't know. My name's Jackie. I am 45 years old, and I live in Belfont, Pennsylvania. I have two beautiful boys, Caleb and Blake, who, of course, mean the world to me. <laughs> Growing up, my mom really just wanted to make sure that me and Caleb knew that she cared and that she would always be there for us. My daughter, Jackie, was a great nurse. She loved her job. She loved taking care of people. She was good at it. Come here. I love you. Now Jackie is as low as she can possibly go. And my mother is an alcoholic. Her alcohol addiction has overtaken my memory. The only memory that I have is my mom sitting on the couch with a glass of wine in her hand. She loves white wine. She said it's just like heaven on earth. I drank two bottles like this yesterday, and then a box which is almost like instant little keg in your fridge. She's not a happy drunk. She gets very mean. You're treating me like a child. Alcohol now is a part of her physical makeup. She has to have that alcohol in there in order to function. This pile here is Bill's. They've been laying there. I actually got this certified the other day. I had to sign for it. I did not open that up yet. I don't pay for, for some of the things that I should be paying for because I'm afraid that I'm going to run out of money for wine. She's going to drink herself to death. She's my baby girl. And to think that we could lose her because of alcohol uh, it, it just, it, it tear, tears me apart. Jackie was our first child, and everyone was just crazy over her. Jackie was the, the spunky, outgoing one. I think that we had a regular, normal childhood. Growing up, she was the cool sister. We had a typical American family. All my kids had good grades. They were wonderful children and a lot of joy with them. I hate to say this because I love my dad, but my dad truly was never there. If he wasn't working, he was, you know, at the bar. I'm a uh, Vietnam vet. I was a door gunner in a helicopter in Vietnam. I seen death, destruction, and killing. So trying to forget that, I. I turned to drinking. I remember worrying about him and thinking, OK, is this the second or third night my dad's not been here? And I would lay there in bed and think, oh, god, I hope he didn't wreck, or I hope he's OK. The family that I love to go and have dinner with just fell apart. I met Jackie through a mutual friend, and we started dating. He was a high school wrestler, and she was a cheerleader for the wrestling team. And that was probably one of the happiest times I remember her. He was a nice guy. He was calm and laid back, a good catch. I thought we were a good match. We dated for so long. I mean, it was off and on seven years. When Jackie got her RN, I would say it was a big deal. Patients loved her. Her coworkers loved her. I was very proud. We all were. That was a great accomplishment. Jackie's life did look wonderful. She was a good mother. Her and Caleb both seemed happy. I realized early on in my marriage that I didn't feel that I was as happy as I should be. I knew he was going to be a good dad, but I think at one point, I almost became jealous of the kids. Like, why don't you want to spend time with me? Like, what's wrong with me? Jackie told me she asked him for a divorce, and Caleb wouldn't give it to her. He said no. It would be better if we just stayed together and worked it out, got through it. I was trapped. So she just decided to stay and live with it. And I think that's when she started drinking. If she wasn't happy in life, then that's what she did. She would drink. Drinking made everything seem just a little bit better. Basically, when the drinking started, everything just got worse progressively worse. I can recall Jackie 
showing up at sporting events for our children intoxicated. I would find bottles of wine stuffed in behind her sweaters in the closet. Jackie was the epitome of a functioning alcoholic. I started thinking it was OK to get in my vehicle and drive. Her explanation to me was, I made her drink. She was that unhappy. So after being married 18 years, we finally got a divorce. After Jackie's divorce, things did not get better. Jackie has lost just about everything she ever had because of her addiction. My mom chose a lot of things over Blake and I. One being alcohol, she chose that over us. And I feel kind of betrayed in a way. You gonna be at my graduation this week? Yeah. Well, what time do you guys have to be there, Saturday? Uh, 10.30. Oh, you have to be there at 10. I figured you'd have to be there a little earlier. She said she would make it to my graduation, but I don't believe her. She's usually drunk when she wakes up. Thank you. But every day, I wish I could have her back to where she, way she used to be. It's terrible. It sucks. As she's picking a glass of wine over me. It just concerns me what it's doing to your body. It's fine, Marie. I'm just looking out for you. I'm good. Ah. Not right now, you're not. Wow, I am. How are you going to be tomorrow morning? I'm going to be fine. She's drunk. And if she continues drinking, I won't allow her to go to graduation because she can't go and embarrass her son in front of his whole entire class and family. Counting on you. What well, you're saying here tonight. I know. Well, so what's going to go wrong? <laughs> then her friend was texting her. She used to date him when we were teenagers. And before I knew it, they were in the bedroom. And I was out here. And I had to sit and listen to it. Jackie. And he's still here. And she's still sleeping. And I'm not sure if I'll be able to get her up and ready to go to graduation or not. Hey. Hey. Jackie needs to get up. Bye. Bye. You need to start getting ready. What time is my dad coming? 9.45. Today is her son's graduation from high school. And if I wasn't here with her this morning, she would still be in that bed sleeping and not even worrying at all about making it to her son's graduation. I'm anxious about seeing my ex-husband, who I despise. I just want to getting drunk and not go to this, but I can't. Well, I hope it goes well. My relationship with Jackie today is probably the best it's ever been. Because at this point, she needs me, and I want to help her. You ready? Watching him graduate it was, like, overwhelming seems like yesterday that he was just a baby and he was hanging off my leg. So when I look back, I see a lot of wasted years. Love you, babe. I haven't been what a mom's supposed to be because of my drinking. Wait, one more. Oh my, God. my ex and I did not make eye contact today. We took a picture with the kids and I. Rick smiled. And we all smiled and we all looked happy and that was it. Caleb actually thanked me for coming to his graduation, even though that's something that a mom should normally do. He knew it was difficult for me to get there, and I got there, but I'm so glad I could just leave. <clears throat> Dear mom. My sole purpose for being here is to help you get better. It's been a long time since you've been happy. Your addiction has been keeping you from succeeding and making us happy. I still remember all the good left in you that's made an impact on everyone in this room. I want this addiction to end for all the bad memories to go away. Even though I love you, 
more than life itself. <laughs> I can't stand being around you and watching you destroy your liver and slowly killing yourself. I miss you, Jackie. I miss you so much. Your family misses you and your beautiful sons miss you so much. I know you love us as much as we love you. Now it's time for you to show that love. Can I have a joke? <laughs> to do this. You need to go through with this. We all love and care about you. We want you to get help. Jackie, will you go to treatment with me today? Today? Today. Like right now, today? Mm -hmm. We've got everything taken care of. Don't worry about a thing. And you're going to go away and get well for yourself and for your family. This could very well be your last chance to live. OK? You're going to California. Long it's a long flight. And yeah, we're going to take care of you. You're going to be traveling with a nurse. And we got your back, baby. OK, trust me, we got your back. Is that a yes? Good. Good. <laughs> yes. Oh. I love you. Hey, welcome to Iris. Hello. I'm Dr. Elena. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Mom. Seeing my mom today. It's probably the greatest feeling I have for the past few months. I am feeling very good about the future for the first time in a long time. It's good, and I want to be that person. You know, I don't want to go back to what I was. My name is Sam. I'm 30 years old, and I live in Indianapolis, Indiana. My name is Brad. I am 28 years old. I am married to the most beautiful woman in the world and my best friend, Samantha. I remember that's, that's the actual picture right yeah. after we got our love tattoo done. Yeah. Painful, but it was worth it. Yeah, no. Brad and Samantha seem like the uh, happiest couple in the world. They're kind of there for each other no matter what. They've been married almost two years now. I promise I'll never let you no. go. And don't wife her because she's the baddest chick. Wife her because she's the realest <laughs> yeah. one. That's true. Yeah. I made that up after the first time we went to jail together. <laughs> <laughs> they say they're soulmates to each other, but they are the modern day Bonnie and Clyde. Now, I'm in handcuffs. <laughs> I'm going to jail. And the cop tells you, all you have to do is just say that you knew that he had the stuff in the car, and we're going to let you go home tonight. And what'd you do? Don't <laughs> off. My brother Brad and my best friends. And my brother Brad and my best friend Samantha are addicted to heroin. Samantha has hepatitis C. If Brad continues down the path that he's going down, if Samantha continues down the path that she's going down, they're both going to die. <laughs> Our family and Brad's family have known each other for a long time. Samantha and I met in elementary school, we played softball together. We were good friends. I coached Samantha in softball, so Brad and Samantha have known each other for a very long time. Samantha and Colleen were friends. She would come over a lot, and that's when I first seen Samantha and met her and you know, knew that I, I liked her. Brad was a little cutie. Always had a major crush on him. <laughs> Colleen would get so upset. All her friends wanted to be with Brad, and she hated it so much. Everyone could tell how much we liked each other and cared. It was just we were both were just too chicken to say anything to one another. When I was 13, I started to get migraines that were excruciating. They would put me in a hospital. After about the third or fourth time being in the hospital, my mom took me to our family doctor. She prescribed me pain pills for my migraines. It made me feel a thousand times better. 
And when I would run out, me and my other friend would use her parents' pain pills. I started getting suspicious of Samantha abusing her pain medicine in high school. I only abused them probably for a couple years, and then I stopped because um, my parents had said something to me. They noticed. Uh, they noticed something was wrong. And I don't know, when they said something to me, it kind of woke me up. It made me bounce out of it. I stopped taking the pain pills, stopped going to my doctor to get pain pills. Um, the heartbreak in their eyes, I didn't want that anymore. Things were going great for Samantha. When Samantha and her boyfriend at the time found out they were going to have a baby boy, we were all extremely excited. I was around 21 when I found out I was pregnant. After I had my son, my doctor prescribed pain pills after having a C-section. I didn't think twice about it. The pressure of being a new mom and then working full time made me feel like I wasn't doing enough. So I started to actually take the pain pills more because it boosted my energy. Because by the time I got home, I was exhausted for the day. Like I could barely get up off the couch just to give my son a bath. It became apparent that Samantha had a problem. Odd things started happening. I like Samantha not showing up for work or calling in late. Samantha worked at the dental lab. The owner of the dental lab told my wife that Samantha's productivity had dropped off. She had let her go. I didn't even really notice that everyone else noticed um, that something was wrong with me. And I had actually started to run out of my pain pills, so I would buy them off the street. And even then, I was still thinking, I'm fine. I don't have a problem. I'm fine. Sam and her boyfriend accused each other of cheating, and they had problems in their relationship. Around 28, me and my ex's relationship started to go pretty bad. Despite Sam's boyfriend knowing that she had a problem with pills, he wanted to keep the family together. He wanted to work things out. He wanted to make it work. He wanted her to get help. But it didn't, it didn't work out that way. By the time Sam was 28, she lost everything. She signed over rights to her son. She lost her career. Samantha just left her home, her boyfriend, her son, and just left. Brad was following his dad's footsteps. Brad was born into welding and heating and air. They were paying for his school. He was making 4.0s. He liked it a lot. So when I was about 20 years old, my ex and I got married. I was extremely happy to find out that she was pregnant and uh, my beautiful daughter came. I thought that I was on top of the world, that everything was going forward for us and going in the direction that we wanted it to be. I was so proud of him. Like, you got this good job, married, you have a family going, like you're really going to go somewhere. I felt like I was on top of the world, but I felt all of the pressure of what comes with being on top of the world. You know, eventually that led to my downfall and crash. Brad had a really bad accident at work. He had messed his back up and was prescribed pain medication. I was prescribed a very powerful opiate. I was told to take these pills each day uh, to help with my pain, and so I did. The pressures of trying to be a dad, going to school, and be a husband was overwhelming for him. I quickly found out that these pills made me feel invincible. I started snorting them, and then I learned how to inject it. Things started to get rough. I was introduced to heroin. I knew from that point forward that this was something that I was hooked on. While I was in Florida and I was going through uh, my first year of sobriety, I started to work as a tech at a treatment center, and I quickly realized that this was something that I wanted to do. I went back to school. I was able to stay clean and sober for a year after that until I moved back home. After he came back to Indianapolis and tried to uh, redo his relationship uh, and got work, uh, he started sliding down the slippery slope, as we say. I don't know if it was his depression or his, uh, he felt like he couldn't uh, man up to his responsibilities. Whatever it was, uh, took him down deeper than I've seen him. My ex-wife and I decided to separate. A lot of it was because of my drug usage. Soon after that, he reconnected with Samantha. It was like love at first sight all over again. He I knew immediately that he was my soulmate before we even started dating. 
He was fresh out of rehab, and I told him, I said, Bub, no, you know, I don't feel comfortable with you guys dating. I don't feel like it's right. We were both clean and sober for the first three or four months. So when Samantha and I uh, first got together, we were both on opioid blockers that prevented us from doing opiates. Samantha had never used heroin before, but she was suffering the withdrawal symptoms and side effects from the opioid blocker that she was trying to get off of. She became very sick and ill with the withdrawal symptoms from that. I just asked him one day if he would shoot me up with it, and uh, he, uh, he did, and he did it too, and that's when he relapsed. I was too scared to lose her, and I was too scared to um, lose our relationship and our love, so I gave in and let it happen. When I found out my brother gave my best friend her first shot of heroin, I was sick to my stomach. After me and Brad were together for about five months, uh, we were laying in bed, and we had always talked about getting married back and forth, but it was almost like we both were either too scared to ask the other person. I just said, let's just get married. The next day, we went down to the courthouse. It was just, it was amazing. We didn't have rings, so we got ring pops which was the coolest thing ever. I learned of Sam and Brad's marriage through social media. It was quite surprising. I thought it was a joke. I got a hold of my sister. She finally confirmed it was a, it was a real thing. Say this whole marriage thing is done with a sham. Brad and Samantha are completely out of control. What's it gonna be? You guys have already lost everything. You guys have already been to jail, I don't know how many times now. Overdoses have happened. What's it gonna take? One of you dying? What? You all right? Why wouldn't I be? Mm -hmm. I'm just asking, just making sure, mm -hmm. man. Brad and Samantha live with my father. I don't like the fact that they live with my father. I feel like he's being used. You about done? Yep. Are you good? About two or three minutes. Don't burn my garlic bread. We just have some issues here. Brad's parents do enable him. They give him money, buy food, gas, cigarettes. They make sure he has it all. You want to go outside and have a cigarette with me before you go? Because I want to talk with you, so. Okay. Brad is and was my best friend, and we've always been there for each other. You know, I haven't had anyone. You know, I can't talk to mom or dad. Yeah. Did I tell you, like, exactly what's going on? No, I heard a little bit about what's going on. So, I have cancer. It's got too much going on right now. At first, I didn't really tell Brad or my family of really what was going on because I just figured they have enough stress going on in their life. So it's a 50-50 chance of getting rid of it completely or not. Yeah. I eventually ended up telling them, and to me, you know, I really wanted my brother's support. So what they're going to do is that they're going to go in, try to take all the cancer cells out, to prevent it spreading. I didn't tell mom all of this or dad. I gave him just bits and pieces of it. There's a lot going on, man. I'm just scared about it. Everything will be all right. I, I know it will be. And I'm sorry that I'm not there as much as you need me to be there. She misses her brother. They used to be really close. I just don't feel like I have my best friend anymore. Did you talk to Sam at all today? Yeah, she texted me, wanting me to meet her at the gas station again to buy her cigarettes. Did you give her any money? No, I don't give her money. I haven't heard from her for a long time. She don't even call me and ask no more. I know, I know it bothers you. Was Brad with her when, she, when uh, you met her? Yeah, he gets out all smiley, looking all nice and dressed up. Like nothing's wrong. I have never met Brad. I don't want to meet Brad. I wish he'd have never met my daughter, and I wish my daughter had never met him. She even asked about Baby Jay? No, and that's the thing. She never asked about him. She'll call and ask about money. She never come out and say, how's, how's Baby Jay doing? I know that your family has one kind of strategy in how to deal with this, and you guys have a different strategy, and nobody's strategy is working. Yeah. And it's because you're trying to be the treatment center. Your job is family. Do they have cell phones? 
Yes, yeah. they do. Okay. I won't pay for it. Okay, does he have a cell phone? Yeah, they have cell phones, and of course it gets it gets replenished one way or another. And what are those one ways or others? That's me, man. So do you think that they should call people to buy dope? No. If you don't agree with something, don't help it happen. It's also a risk. What's the risk? Say Sam ODs, how are they gonna call somebody? There's a fine line. I used to think that too, but you know what? When I was younger, we didn't have a lot of money. We never had a phone, and it was before cell phones. And things did happen. I would run to a next door neighbor or I would run to the nearest house that had a phone. But do you think with them being high or having dope on them that they're going to run to a nearest neighbor? They're not going to go there. And if they're in a bad neighborhood, yeah, nobody's going to answer the, nobody's gonna answer the door. Know, that is not reality. If they weren't able to make phone calls to you if they were in trouble because they didn't have a phone, that means they wouldn't be able to make phone calls to their dealer to buy the dope that got them in trouble in the first place. I get your point, OK? From tomorrow on, that is not an option that I will do again. <laughs> Brad is complaining about being in pain again. It definitely scares me if I think that he's done too much, just because I've seen him overdose, and it was the scariest thing in my life. Hey, Sam. Any concerns or questions? Are you ready? Mm -hmm. I think she wants help. I hope she does. You guys in there? We can tell when she's using, because she's just MIA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've been waiting on Samantha for about two and a half hours, and it's just making me really nervous that she's not showing up. We can't wait for Sam any longer. We need to switch gears, find Sam and Brad, and do their interventions together. I feel like if Brad says no, she's going to say no. Honestly, if they're together or apart, they're, they're both going to be thinking about what the other one's thinking yeah. anyways. The producers have let me know that Sam and Brad are back at David's house, so we're headed over there right now. Are you okay? Yeah. Here, give the left hand line. I know where we're going. <clears throat> what do you feel like right now? <clears throat> I feel stuck. We can't. Ah, breath. Okay. <clears throat> I'm getting to breathe. Brad, are you all right? Yeah. All right, you guys. Well, I don't know. <clears throat> I think we should go to the hospital. All right. Where you really go? But we're like, we're going. Come on. Yep. Uh, we're going. Sit up. Now. Yeah. Baby. Okay. All right. I don't know what to do. Hold on. Don't stand All up right, here just yet. Yep. <clears throat> Hold on. Okay. <sighs> yes, baby. I don't know why she has to do this to everybody. Well, this is do or die. There's Brad in. They're leaving. Oh, they're right trying now. to leave. Oh, go, don't go, go, let them go. leave. Let me out. Let me out. Stop right here. Block their asses. Wait, no. Leslie. No. You are not leaving. Yeah. No, you're not. No. What the f are you guys doing? We need to go the down like this. Hospital right now, dude. Are you kidding me? Dude, he's damn near about to pass out in the f house. Shh, We're taking him to the hospital. Not this under is... the influence, you're not. You're not driving. I'm not under the influence, yes, you are. thank you, you are very much. You. We have a nurse you're not you're not driving. No. I gotta go to the hospital. You We're gonna call the cops get, to get the cops. cops. No, guess, no, guess what? You guess what? To me. Hey, you hey, hey, hollering is not gonna do enough good. Let's go inside. Who the f*** are you? I should. Shut up! It ain't about that. Don't you talk to me like that. You don't talk to me. Shut up. Come on. Let's go in the house. Let's go in the house. 
They care. Care? Care? Stop. What the f have they done or gonna do? Stop it. We're not going. You f up doing this, Dad. Well, guess what? Guess what? Nothing. I want them out. Okay. You guys roll out. Stop. Get away from me! Man, dude, you're gonna make me escalate. Dude, do it then. I want both of us to get help. No, I'm asking you, do Dad, you want to get help? Go, Bradley, know. do you want to get help or not? I'm not going. I'm not going unless we can go to a treatment center together. And that's my decision. Sorry. Samantha, are you going to accept treatment? Because, you know, if you get treatment and you get good, then, you know, maybe you can convince this man that you're married to to get treatment. Because there's another intervention coming anyway at some point. Death has the final say. And we don't want that one to happen. Do you want that one to happen? My hopes for treatment is to stay clean and sober for myself, my son, my family, my husband. I know I need this, and I know I'll do great at this, so I'm excited. I initially said no because I, I didn't want to be separated from Samantha. It's going to be very hard, but we did realize that it, it was best for both of us to have a little bit of space so we can work on ourselves individually. Welcome to New Method Wellness. I'm glad you're here. This finally gives us an opportunity for us to both be completely clean and sober. My hopes for the future are to continue to stay clean and sober, continue working my program, to be reunited back with Samantha, and for us to be a family again. I love you being sober. Oh, I love you being sober. Oh. I love you so very much. I love you so much. My name is John, and I'm 21 and I'm homeless in Patterson. What's up, OG? Fine, yeah. Where'd you get these from? We're fine. Throw it off the truck. <laughs> My younger boy, John John, smart, very smart. Basically, he could do anything he wanted to if he just put his mind to it, you know? What is that? You my brother. Tommy! Is that him? Yeah. Is that your brother? Mm-hmm. My name's Thomas, I'm 23, and I'm homeless in Patterson, New Jersey. Thomas was the sweetest little boy, just loving, loved his family, took care of his little brother, took care of me, was always just a caretaker. That's a new one. <laughs> My kids saw their future in the family business. The boys were so proud of the family business, I mean, since they were toddlers. He started it with a chainsaw and a station wagon, and he built one hell of a company. 
nothing was better than the feeling like waking up in the morning, going to work. Me, my grandfather, and my dad, it was definitely a cool feeling. Unfortunately, drugs came into the situation. My younger sons are both addicted to heroin. Hello, miss. Miss, you spend any change? I appreciate it. Same thing as every night. Hustle, get high, you know? I make money by panhandling and robbing and stealing and selling drugs. On the day Thomas was born, when I first saw him and held him, it was just like, can't even describe the feeling. It's my boy. I loved my son. When I found out I was pregnant with Thomas, I was elated. I was happy. And when I found out I was pregnant with John John, I was shocked. I had an infant, and here was another one. <laughs> but definitely, definitely happy. My sons growing up were almost like twins. Linda brought the baby right from the hospital to my house. Thomas and, and Johnny were staying there already. Our thought was to save money and, you know, start a family and maybe save for a house. I was happy, you know? I had a beautiful wife and two beautiful boys. When we were little kids, you know, my relationship with my brother when we were growing up was, it was solid, you know? It was just like, everything we did, you know, was together. My childhood, good and bad. My parents, they were always addicts and drinking, getting high. Thomas was probably six or seven when he caught me um, using cracker. He saw the pipe in my mouth. But I turned around and he was there and he saw me and I just felt like the biggest loser, piece of crap. I, just, it was, I felt horrible. Linda was a real loose cannon, man. You know, a lot of fun to be around, but nothing but trouble. We grew up with, you know, like, you know, just crack pipes you'd find. Uh, there was always beer cans everywhere, and I could walk through and I could smell. And when I was little, I always thought it was burning rubber, but it turns out now that I know what the smell is now, it's crack. Uh, back then, I just uh, drank a lot. And uh, crack, I'd smoke crack. Uh, I was a crackhead, <laughs> you know? My dad used to uh, beat on her. My mom would beat on him, you know? There was a lot of violence, you know? It was always, there was a lot of violence, a lot of violence. There was holes in all the walls. Thankfully, we had my grandparents. My grandparents pretty much raised me and my brother. I mean, there was, there was a period in time when, when John and Linda would go out every night. I mean, I had the boys constantly. Me and Johnny would go out. I guess we did take advantage of the fact that we did all live together and someone was always home. The grandparents were usually home so we could slip out and do our thing. But I knew they were safe, you know, and they were with my family. So I would come and go. Like, I, in my mind, I really wasn't abandoning them, you know? But now that I, I, I should have been there. My grandmother, she, she would make sure as soon as I came home from school, I did my homework and try to get me to regain the structure of a normal kid, you know? And like try to get me, push me to join sports. I love my grandparents. They're everything to me. Do you think about your grandparents a lot? Love them, man. When I was 16, my mom and my dad separated. My mom kind of disappeared for a while where I didn't hear from her. I didn't know what was up. I was heartbroken leaving my kids there, but I also knew the fighting. It was abusive. It was unhealthy. I protected the boys and kept them with me. They were incredibly resilient kids. Tom and John just went on living their lives. They had their friends. They went to school. They didn't get in trouble. I like school, but um. But no, I didn't graduate. They absolutely loved doing every aspect of tree work. That was supposed to be their future. That was going to be their careers. And once I retired, it kind of fell apart, you know? I was 18, just going on 19, when my grandfather retired from the tree service. Um, he gave me and my father the company. I left them with a bucket truck, a big commercial chipper, chainsaws, you know, enough to keep them going. This time, I thought he would have drained out his life, and it, it never happened. And the business basically went under. I feel like the family business was my future. My life was already in a spiral almost at that point. In a few months' time, Thomas was also on heroin. John was 17, and Tom was 19 when they began living on the street. Tom didn't want to leave his brother there. And then John went in to get them both out. 
And then they all got caught in the web. And now, my son John, my grandsons Thomas and John John are addicted to heroin. It's like Russian roulette. If they don't stop, one of them or all of them are going to die. I just hope I live long enough to see him get straight. And I'm running out of time. Hold out. That's not too bad, though. <laughs> Hold in here, bro. Right now, where I'm living, it's an abandoned house with a garage next to it. It's me, my father, and my soon to be wife, Christina. <laughs> Tommy is probably like the best thing that's happened to me in a long time. I'm like so happy with him, so glad I met him. We live inside the garage because it's smaller, easier to keep somewhat warm. I'm not playing, dude. Tommy's relationship with his dad is pretty much more like a friend relationship. He's on the streets with us, he gets high with us. You know, we're family, and we won't never leave each other. We thick and thin, you know? We're gonna be together. Well, I'm living in an abandoned house, and it's all right. But to a normal human being, they say it's very, uh, you know, like, unhealthy. My girlfriend's Jotty. I've been with her for about probably four months now. She's out there hustling right now, too. Well, we just freaking came back. We were trying to get Molly, but we wound up wandering into Chris and Matt. There's an abandoned bus, the magic school bus in the city of Patterson where all the junkies come to play. A getaway spot where people can hide long enough to just get into a corner and shove a needle in their arm or neck. It's OK. He's CPR certified. Is he? No. <laughs> no, our relationship was strong. You know, he always had my back. I always had his. Tommy. This is the part where I bounce it back up on the train tracks where I started at. John has overdosed probably four or five times that I know of. Yeah. Why don't you go for a minute? Enjoy this wannabe high. Thomas has also overdosed at least four or five times. That is my worst nightmare, finding out that one of my sons has died living on the street. So tell me what you all think is the causes, what we call causes and conditions of Tom and John's addiction. You'd have to start with Johnny, their father and mother. They were years ago doing crack. And Tom and John stayed with us when John and Linda would be in and out doing their thing. So mother and father had oh, active yes. addictions. Do you guys drink? I had a drinking problem, and I walked away from it. Mm -hmm. I should tell you. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I could yeah, sit I down and drink, drink a, 40 years. I'd drink a whole fifth by myself. We party. Mm -hmm. I mean, always in the home. And the kids were always safe. My parents were not the typical parents. My mom, I feel, my mom is an alcoholic. She might have been home more, but she was always drinking. And so John, uh, did he pick up drinking or? During the course of tree work, John's back got bad. He had several back surgeries, pain pills. And the next thing you know, he did crack. And when I retired, uh... Everything fell apart. Everything fell apart. The yeah. boy. Can't smoke crack and take pills and all that kind of thing. Expect to keep a business, right? Well, no, he was fine working on crack. Mm -hmm. That was that was no yeah. problem. He was yeah. up and, and on the job with him every day. He had no problems. Well, what I know about people who smoke crack and do pills is they, they end up selling everything, right? Well, no, it wasn't the crack. It was the heroin. Is the business, he still have the business? And no, that's the problem. So what eventually happened? We gave him all the tree work equipment. Right. And next thing you know, the chip was stolen. Right. Was thousands of dollars worth of chains. It was yeah. just gone. And then, uh, you know, one thing after that another. It broke your heart <laughs> to see your business go down like that. Oh, yeah. John John! I worry about John John on the streets because he's a little more free. John John! I don't think he pays attention to what's going on around him. They're in a very bad area. John John! <laughs> See, this is when I start getting crazy. John John! John John! God. All right, I'm going to Godwin.
No, I'm good. Stop. Getting sick to my stomach now. Until the 25th or 20th. Okay, maybe pull here. Hello? Dad, mommy! Hi, baby! Mommy! Hi! My relationship with my mother right now is a good relationship. We're close, we talk. Definitely better than what it was. So, how's John John been? I haven't seen him in days. I'm looking all over for him. You saw him like, recently? Yeah, I saw him yesterday. Yesterday? He was good, okay? Yep. All right, good. So, there's some food oh, here. Oh my food. God, it smells so good. This. Mama! When Linda stops by, it's very nice. I don't know, it's always nice to get food. All right, you yeah, get a shower now? Very cool. Not bad. Nice. Not bad at all. There's garbage on the floor. There's a rug hanging for where the door is, I guess, for warmth. It breaks my heart just to see them living that way. My Johnny and Linda were an inseparable couple. They really were. But they were this kind of extreme couple. Toxic. Yeah. And when crack came around, and the two of them were just together and, like, you know, running Gone. the streets or locking themselves in the bedroom, and, right. you know, for days. I mean, why would your parents allow that? Johnny was allowed to do whatever he wanted. Interesting. And he was the climber for my father's company. Uh, Johnny wasn't working. Now they that's couldn't a good, do a job. That, OK, now. So, you now, know, you okay. give me money, or I'm not working tomorrow. Right. Everybody holding everybody hostage. When the boys were living there, then they'd use them. Right. Well, I'm going to take the boys. Right. Johnny and Linda would use the kids as pawns. Everybody in the family loved the boys and worried about the boys. So they would threaten to take the boys if they wanted money. They loved the boys, but they definitely used them to get what they wanted. Johnny could do no wrong. We were extremely tight. Growing up. And now from my year, he hates me. I got custody of Tom and John when they were in second and third grade. The boys were with me for the school year. My husband and I and my kids, Sean and Amanda. They did well in school. They were very happy. But at the end of the school year, Johnny and my father, Walt, picked the boys up because Johnny and Linda were granted custody back. Soon after, Johnny and Linda started going back to their same old ways. And when's the last time you saw Tom and John John? A couple years. I'm glad you're being a part of this, but you got to watch yourself, too, you know, because it's very easy to slip back. It's a constant thing, you know? My son, Sean, is a heroin addict also. He started struggling about six and a half years ago. I injured myself skateboarding. I got involved with pain pills, specifically oxycodone, 30 milligram, prescribed from a doctor. Several months in, I was cut from pain pills and began finding them on the street. December 22nd will be a year since the last time I've done heroin. I'm always worried about Sean relapsing because it's just like a broken record, you know, like every time, like Sean come home clean, then he would just start getting like antsy, he'd be on drugs, he'd be out again. Then he'd be in jail, come out, say he, like, he wants a better life, and it would just keep going over and over again. I mean, Johnny has been dealing with stuff for years, but it was kind of shocking when, no, when, when you started seeing Johnny all the years. The first time I used heroin, I asked my Uncle John if he could get pain pills in Patterson. He was unsure, so we took a ride to Patterson, and all we could find was heroin. Me, my friend, and my uncle bought heroin, and that's when I began to sniff. I don't blame my brother for my son's addiction to heroin. It was Sean's choice. I know my brother loves my son, and Johnny, if he was clean, he would never do that. But the addict is a whole nother person. I just hope they take advantage of this, because Patterson is just, you know, it's bad. It's bad. They're gonna die exactly. if this doesn't happen. You're the matriarch of this family. Your attitude has to change about enabling. Because I want them to have some kind of a life. I think that's why she gives them so much. She really does just want the best. Them having the best and the enabling that has gone on through the years is not working. I can't think. What's going on? Are you all right? Yeah, I just want to smoke a cigarette. I understand. I'll make sure she's quick. All right, thank you. Are we done? I think so. I don't know. I'm gonna stop asking questions. I want to get out of here. I know. I, I see it in your face. It makes you want to get on. What? It makes you want to get on. <laughs> you got your... your clip. I know. Uh -huh. Hey, do you have a ring? You have a spike. What? What? Do you have a spike with you? 
talking about no, no. I haven't in a long time. So don't die. We don't know whether we're going to end up doing Johnny first or the next day or the other way around. So let's just be open-minded about that. Thank you, Donna. Right. Take it easy. Thank right you. Now. Thank you. I still feel concerned that somebody in this gang could sabotage all this. Hey, everybody. How's everybody doing? All right. Good. Lewis. Not only are we dealing with Johnny, John, John, and Tom within the family, we also have an issue with another family member that needs some help that's here right now. Linda has uh, succumbed to her disease again. And I just, you know, wanted you to have the opportunity to say anything you needed to say. Just, I know all you guys don't know, but when my doctor took me up to pills, I started heroin. I just want to be a good role model for once. I want to let you know that there's an opportunity for you as well to go to treatment today. Awesome. But you're going to have to go today. And I suggest that you all have no contact after today. OK. And that you focus on yourselves. Dear Johnny, your addiction has changed you so much physically and mentally. I fear what could happen to you every day. It has stolen the happy, fun person and is left behind an angry, paranoid person that doesn't have to be your life. It's not you. It's what the drugs have done to you. I love you. I love you. What's being offered to you is to go to treatment and to go today. What about my boys? Um, we're going to do their intervention next. You can't save the boys, you know? But what we're giving you is a link to life. And we're going to also give them a link to life. So your focus can't be what's going on with them. They're now adults. They have to go take their own journey. Will you go? Yeah. Yeah. He's ready. I'm glad he's not angry, lashing out at everybody, because I kind of thought that's what was going to happen. I got good news for everybody. It looks like we found both the boys. Oh, yeah. So it looks like oh, before yeah. you leave that you'll be able to right. be able to oh, see him. Linda. <laughs> Dear John John. As a baby, I remember cuddly and cozy. You were to hold. You would just, just cling to my hip for hours. And I know I haven't always been there for you as a mom. <laughs> Addiction has ravaged my life, and now it's taken a toll on you. Please take this gift. Please. <laughs> Thank you, honey. I love you so much. I'm going to. Holy sh Hey, how's it going? What's up? Welcome. My gramps. <laughs> he looks good, too. Yeah, he does. Yeah. Dear Thomas, my number one son, I need you to know how deeply sorry and regretful I am for not always being there, either physically or emotionally. Thomas, I know you suffered for that. Addiction has torn a huge gaping hole in our family life. However, today is an opportunity for you to rise above it all and get the help you need, Tom. Please accept this gift I found for you, please. I love you. We're giving you the opportunity, if you say yes, to go to treatment today. Will you go? Yeah. Thank yes? You. All right, great. I love you. And along <laughs> with you, your brother is going to go, John John. Your dad is also going to go. And your mom is going to go as well, because she knows that she needs to get help and get sober, too. And you know what? Christina is going to also get some help, too. There we go. Oh. <laughs> I can see that was stressing you there for a minute, man. Hey, bring it in, man. Come in. Hey, man. We did it. I am very hopeful that it's a success for John, for Linda, for Tom and John John. I just love them and want them to have the lives they deserve. Sean. Sean. What happened to Sean tonight is, you know, he succumbed to the family disease. Hold up, buddy. Hold up. And when Johnny asked him to come in the bathroom to help him shoot up, I think Johnny 
gave Sean a bag of dope and a rig. So Sean got high before the intervention. I feel a lot better physically, mentally. I feel a lot better about myself. My hopes for going back to New Jersey, getting the business started again, working with my father. Heroin definitely weighed me down and kept me from doing things I wanted to achieve in life. Now, not having that addiction and not waking up sick every morning, it's such a relief. Like, I feel now, I feel free. I stayed in the treatment center for 26 days before, you know, I AMA'd. I pretty much left treatment because of, you know, my girlfriend Jody being so far away. I wound up taking a bus all the way back to New Jersey. When I got back to New Jersey, you know, I started using again, but I didn't give up hope, you know. Now I have somewhere to live, you know. I'm looking forward to getting a job. I have a place for me and my girlfriend Jody. I'm in the methadone clinic, and I'm hoping just to move on from there. Right now, I have 82 days sober, and uh, I feel incredible. My whole life has changed in such a short period of time. Right now, I'm an outpatient program. I'm just taking it very slow. I work here now. They got me with my chainsaws in the woods, <laughs> you know, in my little happy place. Being I am clean and sober today, I do have a chance to rebuild my company and get my kids back on track. So far, everything is just going great. My relationship with Tom, now that we're sober and clean, we have such a strong bond. Unexplainable. But when I heard John left treatment, broke my heart. I almost went down the wrong path again when I heard that, you know? But I know I have to put my recovery first because if I'm not sober and clean and of sound mind, uh, I surely can't help him. Physically, I feel better than I have in many years. I get up in the morning, I'm not sick anymore. Um, I'm able to work out, um, to go on hiking in Utah, it's been beautiful. I'm doing a lot of things I haven't done. I mean, I just feel like all human again, <laughs> to be honest. I mean, I don't even know how to thank anybody, you know? I mean, if I had a million dollars, it wouldn't be enough. I just am so grateful. Um, the peace I feel within myself is amazing. So, yeah, I'm forever grateful. You have no idea. My name is Cheyenne. I'm from Helena, Montana, and I'm 22 years old. Here, I'll be in the fort. Come on. Cheyenne is a very energetic, humorous, loving individual. <laughs> Cheyenne's good at everything. She can draw, she can play the piano. She used to be my daughter's role model. These are my bikini competition suits. I was a bodybuilder. My passions were doing bikini competitions and working out anything that had to do with the fit lifestyle I wanted to be with. Shen could have did anything she wanted to with the drive that she had. These suits mean a lot to me. Now she's lost the life that she should have. I inject methamphetamines. She's stolen money from me. She's stolen money from her family. I've heard around town that she's selling herself. I gotta go treasure hunting in the shed. She's at least lost 40 to 50 pounds. Her face is sinking in, her eyes are getting dark. It's a horrible transformation. My body's starting to shut down. I already have liver failure. I'm pretty much killing myself. I am the baby of the family, and family to me is my entire world. Her father did not make any effort to be in her life. My dad broke my heart before any boy ever could, but my mom was always there to be my mom and dad. 
When Cheyenne was seven, eight years old, she was in a dance company. She was one of the younger ones, but yet she was one of the leaders of the group. Most of my childhood memories have to do with my sister, Shandy. We were two peas in a pod. We are two of the same person. Her sister was shot and killed by a person that was actually high on meth. We stayed for three days in the hospital with her and had her on life support, so Cheyenne had to witness all that. We were told she'd never wake up. Our family decided to take her off life support because that's no life to live. Everybody was around the bed when Shandy took her last breath. When they tried to take her body, I took off towards the ambulance screaming that I wanted my sister back. <laughs> she was my best friend. Cheyenne didn't really process it like the rest of us. At the time, I think Cheyenne actually kind of shut down. About a year after Shandy's death, Cheyenne started having a lot of body pains, and it was severe pain in her back and hips. Ankylosing spondylitis is a form of rheumatoid arthritis. My bones are fusing together. It's severely painful. It has to be controlled with chemo drugs. There is times where Cheyenne would wake up and she would start limping one day. I have watched her where she can't even walk. I will end up in a wheelchair, not be able to walk one day. It was a death sentence to her. I'm scared of the entire disease, of the medicine, of everything. She was very depressed about it, and Cheyenne started getting into a lot of trouble. I was your typical hellion. Cheyenne was in fights constantly in middle school. I would have the police at my house all the time. She would be in court. She was on probation. I thought it was a typical teenager thing, when all along it was the death of her sister that was finally starting to come out and her disease. She just kind of did a down road spiral for a little while, and then she met Heath. I met Heath when I was 13 years old through some mutual friends, and I fell head over heels for him. Heath was doing bodybuilding for a while, and Cheyenne really liked the fact that it was a healthy thing for her to do. That's when her life turned around with the bodybuilding. I started getting her into the gym with me, and then it became something that we did together every night. Him and her spent all the time at the gym and always on diets. It seemed to help Cheyenne's medical condition. It helped her move around more and be more active. She was doing amazing, and she looked fantastic, and she looked healthy, and she looked happy. He had my back, and I had his. Eventually, Cheyenne asked Heath to marry her. The love that we had for each other we, we didn't think we were ever gonna not be together. When we moved to Washington, that's when most of the problems we had started happening. I worked so much and we stopped being able to work out together, spend time together. Heath would accuse Cheyenne of cheating on him and Cheyenne would ask me for advice and I would tell her there's a good chance that he's trying to push the blame onto you. I had came home to visit my family and two days before I was supposed to go home, my husband asked me for a divorce in a text message. Do you have an affair? I never cheated on my wife, but I did move on pretty fast afterwards. I wish I wouldn't have broken up with her like that. I wish we would have talked about it first, more in person. He's wanting a divorce in the way it happened. She felt abandoned, unwanted. I didn't feel like I was worthy of love anymore or really anything for that matter. So I gave up. I gave up everything. Her whole life came crashing down in front of her. I hung out with some kids that I went to school with because I was trying to put myself back out there. And it just so happens that those kids were into meth. I think Cheyenne has lost every friend she ever had. This town is horrible with meth right now. Everybody she hangs with is into this drug. I'm not out there doing crazy stuff or not taking care of myself because I do. Sticking a needle in your own arm, that's not crazy? I spent the last year alone. You haven't been alone. Yeah, I have. You know, the thing I think that pisses me off the worst is that you play the victim in I this. I don't play the victim. You're I've made the victim. I've made my choices. I don't blame them on anybody else. 
You know what? You say you don't blame them on anybody else, but you do blame them on everybody else, Cheyenne. It is harder watching Cheyenne die this slow death than it was to lose my other daughter because hers was fast. I wasn't there to help. But with Cheyenne, it's I see it every day. I see her die. We have to make a door for our blanket fort. I wouldn't call it a fort to their home. Right now, I am having Cheyenne stay with me just because this has gotten so severe, and I cannot stand to see my kids cold or hungry. Journey is Cheyenne's boyfriend. She's been with him for a few months now. They just do drugs together constantly. Mom, can you bring me down the road? Something happened. Journey took off walking. Apparently, something's wrong with Journey. And now it's phone's off. Something is wrong with Journey, which means he either did a lot of drugs in a very short amount of time, or he's drunk. It's right there. Journey, come here. Get in. Journey. He, he reeks of alcohol, but. Give me a pill. Can I your pill. Yeah. Journey. You don't die on me. Don't die on me now. I know Journey is on the verge of death, too. And so I think if anything happened to Journey, Cheyenne would never make it. <sighs> Last night, I almost killed myself, mixing too many things. The codependency that they have on each other is not friendship, is not love. It's who, who stole the dope, who got the dope, who got higher. Yeah. That's the only thing they have in common. Sitting back and watching you kill yourself, knowing I can't protect you anymore, hurts me every day and leaves me blaming myself for what your life has become. You know, to me, you'll always be my princess, but I can only be in your life if you're willing to take part in this recovery process. You're my baby girl, and I am terrified to lose you. When we stood over Shandy in our home, feeling that last heartbeat, seeing and feeling what we knew was her last breath, you all screamed and begged for me to save her, and I couldn't. I realize now I cannot save you, Cheyenne, but I can only support your life if you are willing to help yourself today with your addiction. <laughs> Just as I sit here with the only thing that I have left of your sister, these ashes. If you choose to continue on this road, I have no other choice than to move on with my life without you. You will no longer have a place that you can call home. I'm going through withdrawals right now. I'm really sweaty and still feel very good. My hope for you is that one day you will value yourself as much as I value you, and that you will learn to love yourself as much as we love you. Cheyenne, will you please accept this gift that we are offering you today? I don't want to be this person. I know you don't. Get all go. I love you so much. I love you too. Thank you guys. But now, no, this is the best thing ever for her. Hi. Hi. Welcome to Cypress Lake Lodge. I'm Cheyenne. I've been sober for 65 days, and it feels like a whole new way of life that I'm learning how to live. Physically, I'm feeling pretty good. Um, I do exercise about two, three times a week. Emotionally, it's been a roller coaster. 
it's still hard to deal with my emotions in the right way, so I'm learning how to do that here. The best part of recovery for me is that I get to live a happy life again. I don't have to be miserable anymore. My name's Dan. I'm 45 years old, just recently, and I'm an alcoholic. See ya. I love beer. It doesn't matter what kind it is. My favorite beer is an open one. He will drink until he either passes out or they're all gone, he's out of money. With $300, he can be drunk for days, and then that's when the sickness of the addiction really sinks in. Gosh golly, holy jumping. <laughs> Dan and I were pretty close growing up. He was a good older brother. I liked hanging out with Dan. As a kid, he was somewhat of the golden child. He was good at everything he did. He excelled in sports, soccer, hockey, track. Dad believed that Dan was on his way to be a successful professional hockey player. He would stay at practices, sometimes yell give Dan crap if he didn't give it his all. I tried so hard. I did care about what he thought. Dad had a lot of expectations, and expectations became too much, and Dan struggled. He felt pressured to score a lot of goals, to be the captain. Playing hockey was supposed to be fun. But it wasn't. He put a lot of money, a lot of effort into driving me to games and everything, but he, he drank. My dad would be the drunk guy in the stands. Dad was an alcoholic, there's no doubt about that. You know, we go to school in the morning, you get home from school, and there's drinking, there's drinking, there's drinking all the time. And he'd had multiple heart attacks, could you bypass heart surgery, and retired at 37, 38 years old, so it was a, a medical retirement. He worked in a factory. He was sole provider of the house, so probably was really tough to be told you can't work anymore. A lot of times, my mom took off with my two sisters and my brother, and I stayed back because I didn't want my dad to wake up uh, by himself. Dan and my dad had a very love-hate relationship. He loved my dad very much, but he hated my dad's drinking. Sometimes it would get physical. When I would go over to Dan's house, his mom and dad, you, you could just feel the tension in that house as soon as you walked in. His mom was very cold, so most often Dan would come to my house. When Dan and I started dating, he was just tall, dark, and handsome to me. It was a definite good catch. At that same time, Dan kind of lost focus with sports and that, I think his focus became me. One time, Dan and I went for a walk and we were late coming back, I guess, for practice. And his dad chased him down the road with his shovel. He's like, you're gonna be late for practice. He literally wants to hit me with it. He's very hurt that his dad was so mean to him because he loved his dad. Dan quit playing hockey altogether. I think it crushed my dad because I think he lived his life vicariously through Dan, and that's when things changed. He moved out shortly after that. I had a girlfriend. I got my driver's license and moved right out of the house. I wanted to be a police officer. That's what I went to school for. It was, I guess, a little bit of a dream, but I wasn't willing to commit the effort that went with it, so. I went and worked in a factory instead. And then we got pregnant. I was very excited because I knew that if I had a kid, I would not treat it the way that my dad treated me. I will do whatever it takes to make sure that kid has fun. He'd work all overtime to provide for the family. As far back as I can remember, 
Dan's always drank in high school, I mean, when he was young. But when Dan started a family of his own, it seemed like his drinking was in excess. It's always been in our lives, but I think it amplified as time went on. There was some red flags, excessive drinking on weekends. There would be beer flying, but he would slow down his drinking, so I wouldn't worry. Dan was a good father. He was the dad that would get on the ground and play with the kids, go and kick a ball. Loved them, never shied away from changing a diaper. He was my perfect guy. Shortly after Jacob was born, Dan's father passed away unexpectedly in a car accident. He had a heart attack while he was driving and run into a tree and, and passed away. He didn't make it. I miss my dad like crazy. He was my best friend. They were friends and enemies. Even though his father was an alcoholic, he loved his dad. He lost the person that he did look up to for praise as little as it ever was. Dan just went right downhill from there. His drinking, there was no stopping at all. As long as his eyes were open, he was drinking. My mom tried to help Dan. I think she really struggled with Dan's alcoholism because she lived it with my dad. When it became too much for her to handle, she just pulled back. Dan didn't want to work. We were sinking financially, so he would drink more. He wasn't that caring, selfless person anymore. We had the average family, but behind the closed doors where nobody knew what was going on, like nobody was happy. We moved up north and lived with my grandparents. I remember saying bye, dad, and he just looked at me and said bye, buddy. We didn't see him and he didn't reach out. It felt like our dad had died. For 10 years, he didn't see those kids and I raised them by myself. If it wasn't for Dan Jr. going to see his dad, checking on his dad, we would have not known what was going on in his life. I decided to let my dad come live with me because he was living in a rooming house. It wasn't the best living situation for him. Dan Jr. felt compelled to take his dad in, simmer his drinking down with some rules and structure. When he finally moved in, it wasn't a week after. He had broken almost every single rule, drunk every day, smoking constantly in the house, letting my dogs out. You think you need more beer right now? I can handle some. You gonna clean my truck tomorrow? Um, I'll buy you some beers if you clean my truck. Is that fair? Yep. He needs it every morning now. When he runs out of beer, he won't talk to anybody. He's depressed, he's shaky. That's his body telling him, like, he needs to be drinking. I feel obligated to go out and buy him even just one or two beers to just kind of get him over that feeling. Bentley, come here, please. Bentley? Bentley. Oh, gosh, golly, Bentley. Bentley, I got to lock you in uh, before I go. Wow. That felt like a charm. All I want is $20 to some money. We've been enabling my dad for the past couple years. I want $20. That's all he wants. Go. <laughs> we do it just because he's very miserable when he doesn't have beer. That's all you get. Since he's lived with me, I've found myself becoming easily agitated, angry all the time, frustrated, stressed. I'm kind of just a loaded weapon at this point. Do you not use your brain? I use it all the time. No, get up. Um, gosh, golly. I was going upstairs, actually. I'm going upstairs. You're not drinking anymore, man. OK, then I'm going upstairs, and you Good. can run up. Get upstairs, because I've had it. I don't even want to see you for the rest of the night. You won't have to. I just want to start my own life. I don't want to have to come home from work, take care of my dad. Don't bully me. I'm not bullying you. I'm giving you rules. The rules have reversed. Dan is the child. Come on, Dad. Let's go upstairs. I just want to rest. 
get upstairs. And they're on their way. Yeah. You're just in the parking lot. Remember, breathe, breathe slowly. Be all right, bud. Hey, Dan. Oh, I've not met you. My name is Andrew. Come on in. Andrew. How are you? Fine, thanks. Ah. See your old family's over there? Yeah? You coming to join us? No. No? Hold on, slow down, Dan. <laughs> Mind if I join you for one? No, no. A little freaked out to see your family there? I'm a little bit. I have a trust issue. Right. And when I was yeah. trying... Yeah, yeah, no, it... I hear you. I hear you. The idea would be you'd go back in. You're going to hear your family, hear what they have to say, hear the love and the sadness in their voice. Like, that's what it's about. Yeah, I... Uh, no. As a dad, I know deep down in there, there's that dad in you still. Mm-hmm. It never left. It never left. You're going to hear some tough stuff when we go back in. All right, let's go. Let's go do this. Thanks for coming back. Oh, hey, holy jumping. So you see the whole gang's here. I do. Everyone is here because they love you. So everyone's going to read a letter. There'll be some tough I stuff understand. in there. I understand. All right. I watch you drink to the point of blackouts. I've seen you come home, beat up, bruised up, messed up. All of the above have been witnessed by our three children affecting each one of them differently. I'm having to once again protect them from you, their father. Take the offer of help to my only dad. I'm here because I'm not ready to lose you. There's so much that I still need from you. You don't care about yourself anymore and you've lost everything because of alcohol. It makes me feel like we weren't good enough. If you choose not to take this out, I will cut all connection with you. I can't continue to hurt myself trying to help you. I miss the dad I remember when I was younger. You were always there for me. Now I feel that you and I have shifted roles. Now you rely on me for providing a safe place to live. If you do not accept the help offered today, I have no choice but to cut you from my life and no longer have you live with me. Are you willing to accept the help being offered to you today? Um. Dad? Yes? <laughs> you willing to go right now? Yeah, like, I, I'm more, can you smoke in it? <laughs> you can't smoke in the plane, but you can smoke at the facility. Get to on a plane. We're gonna hit the road. My time at Ledge Hill has been uh, life-changing, to say the least. It is a really good feeling to actually be sober. I, I wake up in the morning and I'm not hungover. I'm not still drunk. I'm a happy person now. We've been waiting for this moment and none of us could be happier. Ready? Ready. <gasps> hey, my How are you? <laughs> How are you doing? We've seen you guys forever. He just looks like a totally different man. Now he's like using full sentences, he can carry a conversation. His whole mentality's changed and it's all for the better. I'm looking forward to being a role model. I look forward to this new me and my relationship with him. Jordan, I'm 34. I would definitely consider myself an alcoholic. I don't feel well. What do you want? I made mean, some alcohol right now. Did you already have some this morning? Yesterday. You can drink up to 750 milliliter of vodka in a single sitting. You all right? He has to be helped to do normal daily tasks, and he really can't help anyone right now because he can't even take care of himself. Hi, baby. It's beautiful. 
Seeing Jordan today, he looks like a complete shell of his former self. Jordan had a very accomplished career, starting with his military service. He's an accomplished veteran who served our country. After that, he went into the nursing community. He was a beloved ICU nurse. He fought on the front lines of COVID. Jordan. Yeah. What are you doing? I'm fine. No, you're not fine. There you go. Jordan's drinking has caused a lot of heartache and a lot of stress on every member of our family. What'd you drink? I'm fine. Go down. I don't want to lose you, OK? Yes, ma'am. All right, darling. The alcohol addiction has gotten so out of control with Jordan that I am afraid he's going to die. This intervention, it is his life or his death. So you are feeling like you need a drink yes, right now? probably about three want. ounces. All right. So today I'm preparing a monitored amount of alcohol for Jordan every three hours to keep him stable because last night he drank so much that I was concerned he was going to have a stroke. I don't like myself doing this because Phil and I don't allow drinking in our home, but when he is this dependent on alcohol, if he just quits, he will go into seizures, and I can't handle that. So it's better than me seeing him in a state where I would have to call 911 and get an ambulance to come and intervene. Tell me a little bit what's been going on and... Very happy that we're able to do this and hopefully get Jordan the help that he needs. A lot of people, they get addicted because of some form of trauma. So I wanted to find out what your childhood was like. What was it like for him? My parents, you know, raised us the best they could. We never in childhood, like, really wanted for anything. We would go on vacations together as a family. We went to church every Sunday together as a family. We would all sit down together and have dinner as a family. So what was going on at 18? And that's when he joined the Army. During my time in the Army, I met my wife. And overall, it was the best times of my life. I loved where I was working in the Army. And then I loved building a life and a family. I have two daughters, age 12 and 6 right now. I was 100% involved at any second that I could be. I changed diapers. I take them to school, fishing, everything you can do outdoors. I was excited to be a dad. Trauma is experiences that build up. So did he ever talk to you guys about how it was working in ICU during COVID? It took a lot out of him. Yeah. He was the last person that a lot of these people saw. And I just remember him saying that, you know, the amount of death that he was around was really hard for him. I think it was very shocking for Jordan to see that he was losing so many patients to COVID-19. And I remember that's when Jordan's drinking went from casual drinks to drinking on a day-to-day -day basis. And it just seems like it's progressively gotten worse. He was telling me that like he would stop off and get three bottles of wine and drink those on his way home just so he could go to sleep. That was his everyday routine. That was a period of time when it was very hopeless for him. I saw the relationship between him and his wife deteriorate. And how long did he work in ICU? Up until nine months ago. <laughs> Jordan had gone to work, just got to work, and his wife called him while he was there on the floor and told him that she wanted a divorce. She just unloaded on him, saying, you're never home. You know, you're drunk a lot. And uh, all the distress that created caused something to happen to him that particular night. Can you go over that for me, what happened that night at work? I can't really say that on camera, man. 
that's really what made him hit rock bottom. After he, he overdosed, was not able to go back to the hospital that he was working at. I'm sure he's probably just stayed drunk the entire time to deal with it. And unfortunately now, he's been drinking very hard alcohol as well. Drinks that's half his, a bottle of vodka. It's just, that's that's his, his life right that's now? His, his, since, <laughs> since our brother died, our middle brother, Aaron. No way. So sorry. What happened? Um, uh, in October of 21, we lost our middle brother, Aaron. How did he pass away? The official report is that he died of suicide. Wow. How old was he? 31. 31? Oh my God, so sorry. If he doesn't get help, we will be burying another brother and my parents will be burying another child and then we'll probably be burying a mom right after that. Wow. How are you feeling, Jordan? I'm feeling okay right now at the moment. I'm not highly intoxicated by any means. And they just pulled up outside. Thank you. Fingers crossed. Oh my gosh. Feeling all right? Yeah. Can't feel my feet, but that'll be all right. Hi, Jordan. How you doing? I'm Ken. Nice to meet you. Two. Jordan. Jordan. When did you get here? A couple days ago. So I had the opportunity of sitting down with your family and planning an intervention for you. They just put together some thoughts, and they just wrote them down, if it's OK, if they could share them. Hopefully a great opportunity for you. But that's all up to you. I'm willing to listen, yeah. Derek, you want to go? Jordan, I'm here today because at one point in time, you were my best friend. <laughs> Some of the best memories in my life were made with you. <sighs> you and I have grown apart over time. Life has taken us on different paths as we had our families and worked to provide for them. I deserve to have my brother back and mom cannot bury another son. So mom, you wanna read your letter? Jordan, I am here today because I love you. I remember your childhood and it makes me smile. And then you became a father, an absolutely great dad. Sadly, Ever since the alcohol has taken you over, it has compromised your relationships with your precious girls. It has stalled your nursing career and caused so much stress and worry on dad and I. Every day, I fear that I'm gonna go check on you and that you'll be dead. Jordan, I don't want to live this way anymore. Now you need to be here for yourself, too. They're all here because they love you. And they're all worried about you because they already lost one sibling. They can't lose you. And they won't. We found a treatment center in Texas, Warrior's Heart. And it's for vets and first responders. And one of the common things that I heard is that therapy doesn't work for you. Typically, yeah, because when people ask me, how are you feeling? I can't really tell you. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't have feelings. No. I mean, everybody flew in here for this. So your sister came all the way from Italy. You want to answer her question? If you are willing to go to Warrior's Heart right now, Well, I don't need my stuff. 
Do you have your bags packed? Ready. Is there a flight booked? Yeah. As all you have to do is say yes. I want to get well. Anything that you need, Mom will mail you. We'll make sure you get. And as soon as you get on that airplane, I'm going to call the facility, and they're going to call the courts, and they're going to get everything arranged. So they will start that process for you to be getting your girls back. All right, well, fine. Good. Give right. a hug. Feels great to be sober right now. Physically feeling great. Mentally, a lot of the clarity is coming back, so. Uh, so we have a lot of different coping strategies, group therapy sessions, process groups, and then you have one-on-one -on -one sessions with your individual therapist. You know, doing different projects there at Woodshop. They've got a canine uh, facility where, you know, you can train service dogs and, you know, bring them home. Looking forward to getting back into the hospital, working as a nurse in the ICUs. Be with my kids. We FaceTime every day. I definitely miss them. But, you know, being able to see their faces and hear their voices every day is just an inspiration, you know, motivation to keep, you know, moving forward and, you know, doing the next best thing. My sister Sarah was one of the biggest models in the Bay Area. She was getting gigs for some of the major stores, major makeup companies. I've done everything from Benefit Cosmetics, Old Navy, The Men's Warehouse, Charlotte Russe, amongst many more. She had pictures all over the place. I was just like, whoa, that's my niece. Whoa, that's my niece there too. What I liked the most about modeling was how much money you made in like such little time. She was making $10,000 a photo shoot. She had the world at her feet. But right now, my daughter Sarah is addicted to fentanyl. And in addition to fentanyl, Sarah is also using meth. So I got the perfume that I was trying to have you find. And this is 35. That's like 120 so far. So we could get 12 in blues. Because of her addiction, she has a police record. I've lost count how many times I've been arrested. Mostly it was because of possessions. But I also have two ID thefts and two theft ones. She's so skinny. She's like size double zero pants right now. Her cheeks are sunken in. I'm currently homeless. I often stay f with friends or in cars, hotels. Mom. Hi, honey. Yeah. Have a hug? Yeah, I love you. I love you so I much. You. Joshua is my 11 year old son. I'm so excited you're finally here. I know, I missed you. When Sarah was 17, she met a boy she really loved. And about five months into the relationship, Sarah found out she was pregnant. Holding Joshua for the first time was complete bliss. It was like nothing I've ever experienced. Sarah took to motherhood right away. She was very protective, very loving. But because of Sarah's addiction, right now I have temporary custody of Joshua. That's been almost two years. I really wanted to be here before you woke up. It's OK. Right now, me, my two kids, and nephew all live in my mom's apartment. What do you want to do today? Uh, I'll play a board game. Ooh. Well, let's give it a try then. You want to? Yeah. We could see if Auntie Laura or Nana wants to play too. Since her addiction, Sarah has sometimes gone without seeing Joshua for like two months, sometimes longer. Did you have lunch, baby? Uh, yeah, I had a like, cheeseburger. Okay, honey. 
It's important for me to see my son because although I'm struggling, I still want him to know that I love him and I want to be there for him as much as I can. Mom? Just a second, Joshy. Oh, she's in the bathroom. Come on. No, come here. No, come here. She takes like around like an hour or two hours in the bathroom, but it's still really fun to spend time with my mom. Sarah was my second child. Ashley is two years older. And when Sarah was two, I had my third child, Billy. Even though my dad wasn't around, we had my mom. She always was there for us, and my grandma and grandpa. So we always had that love and support that we needed. When Sarah was eight, I had met someone. We were living together for about a year. And that's when I had my daughter, Laura. Sarah and I were super excited to have a little sister, but Laura's dad was an addict, so that was not a healthy relationship, and he wasn't a healthy figure for us. My relationship with Laura's father was very turbulent. I did start suffering with some depression because he was abusive and he would threaten to kill me in front of my kids if I ever tried to leave, and just horrible, traumatic stuff going on. How bad was it? Laura's dad was a dealer. He was a dealer. Mm -hmm. As soon as I smoked it, I felt better, and I got addicted to meth that quick. It just went bad fast. There was no structure, rarely any groceries in the house. And I was like made fun of a lot at school because my clothes would be dirty. One time, she had to go on her knees and pretend to be a dog and beg people for food because she was extremely hungry. It was just, yeah, completely embarrassing. And then you guys were with your grandparents while her mom was in rehab? Yeah. OK. And then so, Sherry, when you got out of the rehab, what happened? I didn't have a lot of family support at that time. So we ended up at a family homeless shelter for a little bit. Oh, wow. That definitely had to have been a culture shock. It was a little scary. <laughs> It was just dirty, and I remember like maggots coming out of the carpet, and there was like feet of just like piled up on the floor. It was always a disaster. As she was getting older, she had two jobs. She was really together. Then when Sarah was 18, she submitted her modeling picture, and she ended up getting signed by Ford Modeling. Sarah had one of the biggest glow-ups of all time. She went from being bullied and teased to becoming one of the biggest models in the Bay Area. She was very successful, and she was making a lot of money. There was like a life-size poster board of me in like every Macy's, and it's funny, my cousin sent me a picture of her like posing next to it. It felt like she was on top of the world, and there was no stopping her. And then when I was 19, I went to a My Chemical Romance concert and met my favorite band member. Over the course of a year, we kind of just became inseparable. It wasn't long after that we got engaged. And then Sarah moved to LA to be with him. They were in love. They were planning future together. I signed with an agency in Los Angeles, but they were like, if you really want to be taken seriously, you need to lose weight around your hips. I tried exercising and stuff like that, but it just wasn't able to do it. They felt good. They suppressed my appetite, and I didn't really see it as a problem. But looking back on it, Sarah and her boyfriend had addiction issues. They would go out and, you know, drink and hang out more than, than the average person. And then it started to really impact my modeling career because I started showing up late, was unresponsive to texts, 
and really started losing out on a lot of gigs. Then, when Sarah was 20, our family had moved up to Bend, Oregon. My brother-in-law had gotten a, a really good job, and we just kind of all followed suit. Both of them seemed a little unhappy living in Oregon. Oregon was such a culture shock. Like, there wasn't any, like, amusement parks, malls, things that we were used to doing together. And Sarah's fiance's fans weren't happy with their relationship. On social media, a lot of people were bullying her and telling her to kill herself. It was pretty scary. And it was hard to not hate being in my own skin. So one day, we went to the car dealership, and um, the guy who sold us our Toyota ended up selling us our drugs, too. I noticed Sarah was sleeping a lot. Her fiance was missing flights. She gave it all up for her addiction and seemed to not look back. I think it helped her to escape her past childhood traumas. I started going into hospitals to get prescriptions because I couldn't find them to buy off the street. And when I was 23, I was blacklisted from hospitals for faking injuries. And so that's when I turned to heroin because that was easier to find. I found out that Sarah was using heroin when she came over to my house and started nodding off while we're talking. And that was um, pretty disturbing. You didn't. How are you? Oh my gosh. <laughs> you are more than just beautiful on the outside. Your heart is full of love. You are so important to me, but watching you hurt yourself is too hard. We all make mistakes and your addiction doesn't define you. It's never too late to turn your life around. I love you forever and always, no matter what. Please put yourself in recovery, Sarah. I don't want to think about how I will ever tell your son. He will never see you again or hear his mom say, I love you and I'm so proud of you. Please don't let these drugs steal that from him and from yourself. Will you accept this gift? Um. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, honey. My son deserves a healthy and present mom, and I know in order to be that, I have to just give this my all. So hopefully this is the last time that he has to go through that. Austin would light up a room, always wanting to do things that would please people. He always made it about his family and, you know, his Uncle Adam and myself and, and Nanny and Papa and everybody was just so important to him. Everybody's really close and we're all, it's like friends, it's not a family. We get together, we have good times, good laughs. She puts her hand in and the bird starts going. <laughs> <laughs> Me and my family, we, we'd always stick together. We always, you know, did traditions together. We always got together for everyone's birthday. Honestly, family was number one to me. And once in a while, you catch a glimpse of the old Austin. Where are you going? Hey, Give me a minute, please. But um, it's getting further and further apart. My name is Austin. I'm addicted to opiates. His priorities have definitely changed and his choices have changed. Yeah, I might have to run out quick. Why? I gotta go meet someone. You do this every time we get together. I know, it's just I gotta run and go do this. I 
I've seen him go from having all kinds of stuff to where he is now, and he's got absolutely nothing. He sold everything. I have a huge video game collection, or at least I did. And uh, it, was, I, it was appraised at like 35 grand or something like that, something absolutely insane. Thank you. Thank you. 60 bucks? Yeah. And I sold most of it for drugs. Hey, here, I got an extra five for you. <laughs> Point out, right? Okay, thank you, I appreciate it. It's drugs, it's sleep. It's drugs, it's sleep. It's drugs, it's sleep. Like he doesn't know how to be sober anymore. When Austin was born, that was an incredible day. It was an exhilarating day. It was the biggest high of my life because he became my world that instant. It was wonderful. I was a young father. I was uh, blessed with a baby boy who was healthy. He was a great baby, just super happy. Just a, just a happy boy who brought incredible joy and, and love into our home. My sister, she was a teen mom. And my parents were very supportive of my sister and Austin's father. He was an easygoing kid. He was a smart kid, a very smart kid. My uncle Adam and my dad, they were kind of like the ones I looked up to as a kid. I thought my dad was the coolest. He taught me how to, you know, go fishing, hunting. My sister was a lot more dedicated to the relationship than Austin's father was. I guess in the beginning, it would be like any relationship. And then you have your ups and downs. What do you got, Austin? She wanted a family, and he didn't want to um, commit 100% to the family life. When Austin's dad and I had decided that we were no longer going to be dating, that was hard on Austin. We only saw my dad on Wednesdays and then we every second weekend or whatnot. Austin always missed his dad. You know, obviously, it's your, it's your dad, right? We would always play board games on the weekends, watch movies all the time, and, you know, play road hockey out in the driveway or soccer in the backyard, and it was just great. Seamless transition. We would have Taco Tuesday every Tuesday. You know, we had, we had game nights on the weekend. He, he was a good guy, you know what I mean? He, he was, he's an amazing stepdad. When he was about 13, 14, he got approached to go to a program. It's called the Ivy Program and it's for ex exceptionally smart kids academically. I always went to class, loved math, loved, like, I, I was really passionate in school. I didn't choose to go because most of my friends were going to another school. And when he chose the social side of things for high school rather than the academic side, I was a little disappointed, a little nervous. We started uh, seeing lots of changes in him. He started making some choices that um, I would I didn't agree with, with regards to the, the friends he chose to hang out with. Friends who would skip school, friends who would explore um, drugs, marijuana, that kind of stuff. I, I, was still, I was still a good kid, you know what I mean? Like, I always still went to school, you know? I, it was just, I was like, oh, I'll smoke weed, you know, on the weekends or, or at a party. We always had chats about, you know, making the right choices and, and how that affects us later in life. He would say, well, it's just marijuana. It's just marijuana. My back's really bad, right? So I started getting Percocets. I was getting 30 a month. I said, hey, you know, it's not working for me. I started getting 60 a month. I said, you know, I, I, I can't, I need more, man. Like I'm taking one in the morning, one at night. And I fell in love with the feeling. I fell in love with the high. It just, it, it takes over your life and you don't think it's going to. And then you become an addict. Everybody just kind of thought it would, it was just a phase. Everyone thought it would go away, you know? And he's going into heavier drugs and then heavier drugs. And it felt like his life was just all about where he was going to get his next high or how he was going to get through the day. And he was at this guy's place or that guy's place. He just wouldn't come home. He, he stopped going to school. You can't call the cops because they're over a certain age. They won't do anything. We were worried, definitely worried. When I saw the downfall of him after the drugs, I didn't want anything to do with it, so I kind of stayed away from it all. 
He's burning all of his bridges. He's lived with his mom and Jeremy, and that didn't work out. He lived with his dad, and his, after a while, his dad kicked him out. We don't have that father-son relationship. He's sick, and he's isolated himself. Now he's living with his grandma. This is the last straw. I'm not going to watch you kill yourself. I have a lot of guilt um, that she's having to deal with this at the age that they're at because they're supposed to be grandparents and they're not supposed to be dealing with this at all. <sighs> Austin, in the last year, he's, you can tell he's definitely gone downhill. He was in jail for a week or two. They had tried to get money out of her father. Um, and why they did that, they needed the money for drugs. Hi, beautiful. I have heard about Ali. Um, I have heard that she's into the same uh, uh, type of drug use um, and that they, they do it together. Hey, shh. Just keep it down, because everyone's sleeping, right? So. Austin? What? OK. 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 What is I don't this? Know. It's a needle package, Grandma. Whose is it? It's probably for me. It was, in my, it, was in my, it was probably in my bag, I know. Or in my pants pocket, and it fell out. So I know, Grandma. Is that what you do? No, I usually smoke it off foil. And you took my foil. I would like that foil back. That's OK. OK, you have to take clean. I know. You can't. I know, Grandma. You're killing me here. I know. He's such a great kid. Like, he really is. Seeing him like this, it's like a slow death. It's like you just, you're slowly watching him die. And I feel like I'm letting it happen in front of me. I'm no criminal. <laughs> I gotta find this foil that she threw out. I don't know if it's in here, which is disgusting. I'm pretty cheesed because it had a full toke on it. Her and I, that's all we talk about. We talk about his drug use. You know, we're sending pictures back and forth of all the drug paraphernalia she's finding in her home. Spoons, needles. Not spoons. Right, but you can't be leaving that crap I know. around. You can't even and, be doing and I it. Didn't, in the... It was just a wrapper. It wasn't even the. You can't be doing that. I know in it's house. not in her house, Mom. Or leaving it anywhere. You're killing yourself. I know. My bottom line. He's got to move. Okay. He's got to move out. But I, d I can't cut ties. I will just be honest with you that that is definitely a, a slippery slope because you got to realize that's A, that's a pattern you've had with him for a long time. B, it's a part of your nature. And that's a beautiful thing to carry. It's just that at this time, it's actually hurting more than it's yeah. helping. Oh, I'm not doing this shit, you guys. I'm out. No, don't, no, don't touch me. No, you guys f***ed up. He's running. Jerry, Jaden. Austin? No. Let's go, Jerry. Austin. Don't touch me. Austin. F off. This is what you need. I don't care. Get the f off me, Dad. You weren't ever there, so get the f out of here. I'm here now. I don't give a f I'm telling you, I'm straight you give dad. Us 10 seconds, son? please. No, I, no. Well, I've been here for you. I don't care. I know you have. Then f off. It's your little brother, man. You don't f like I don't you. 
lie to you. Lie to you guys. We didn't lie to you. I don't care. Get the out of here, guys. I think we gotta let him walk. Do you think he's gonna come back with us, or...? No. Look, he's not coming. Let's regroup inside. I was lost. I didn't know where to go. I didn't know what to do. I was broken. I had nowhere to live. I ended up living in a shelter. I knew I had to get help. I texted my grandmother. I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. You know, I hate my life. I, I, I'd rather die than be dope sick. My grandma ended up picking me up with my mother, and my mom said, I brought the letters from everybody. Can I read them to you? After I read those letters, I was like, maybe it is time to like, actually do something about this because I'm done with this life. I'm just, I'm so over it. I love life, I'm the old me again. Just the joy I have that wasn't there when I was on drugs. It's really amazing. Rain swell. 